You're pretty close, pretty close. So with that, I'm Dr. Rosalind Biggs. I am with the College of Veterinary Medicine, and uh, we're excited to have you today. Joining me on stage for moderation is Dr. Eric Clary. He is also with the College of Veterinary Medicine, and I will let him take it from here. Thank you, Dr. Biggs. Our first uh, speaker is Dr. Rudra Chanapanavara, who will be presenting differential replication and antiviral responses to SARS-CoV-2 and its variant viruses of concern. Thank you, Dr. Cleary. Um, thank you very much for the organizers for uh, pro giving an opportunity to uh, present our work. Today I'll be uh, speaking about some of the recent work uh, my 10-month-old lab doing uh, at OSU, OSU Vet School. We mainly study coronaviruses. Uh, recently, we are working on how these variant viruses uh, are causing differential disease and what, what is the basis for those. Um, as uh, many of you know, coronaviruses are enveloped positive sense RNA viruses. Uh, these are largest known RNA viruses, which have a genome size of around 30 kb. Um, there are uh, uh, now seven known human coronaviruses. Four of those, if you don't know, um, human coronavirus 229E, OC43, NL63, and HKU1. They were identified quite a few years ago. Uh, they cause uh, what we call as common cold um, respiratory illness. And, and they can also cause some severe infections or severe disease. Uh, in children's, occasionally in elderly individuals and, and individuals who have a uh, compromised immune system. More recently, um, after 2000s, we have seen the emergence of three uh, highly pathogenic coronaviruses. One first of those was SARS coronavirus, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. And then in 2012, emerged uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, which emerged mainly in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, and then spread to 27 different countries, has so far caused you know, more than 5,000 infections, 8,000 infections, in fact, and, and more, more than 800 deaths. But what most important are the most, uh, the, the coronavirus that caused most damage is SARS-CoV-2, uh, what we now call as a COVID-19 pandemic. It has now infected more than 200 million people with more than 4 million uh, deaths. In addition to the human coronaviruses, we have several other animal coronaviruses of animal and veterinary importance. Uh, some of those are PEDV, uh, TGEV, um, FIPV, infectious bronchitis virus in birds, and, and, and there's a recently identified severe acute diarrhea syndrome coronavirus in pigs. So the coronaviruses have a wide host range, wide uh, tissue tropism. Um, more recently, or a year or so ago, um, with, with the vaccination efforts and antiviral developmental efforts, there has been um, emergence of uh, what we now call as uh, variants of concern. These are SARS coronavirus variants of concern. Uh, some of those are B117, also commonly known as UK variant, and B1351, that's a South African variant. P1, that's a Brazilian, and the more recently, um, the, the Indian variant or, or Delta variant, that what we call. One of the main features of these viruses is their ability to evade antiviral response and their ability to evade the antibody response that is generated following immunization or vaccination. So what we really don't know is you know, how different these viruses are in terms of their replication, in terms of their response to uh, antiviral treatment. That's what we are doing in our lab right now. So we have these different uh, coronavirus variants of concerns, and we tested first their replication. As the first graph shows, shows we used uh, immunocompetent human A549 cell lines. We infected these cells with uh, 0.1 MOI of virus, and we, we checked the different kinetics of the virus. As you can see, uh, the wild type Washington isolate that was isolated initially in the United States and then the South African variant, they replicated equally. In comparison to these viruses, the UK variant, B117, and the Brazilian strain or isolate, 
uh, I would not call the strain, these are variants, um, they each replicated to much lower levels. But we, when we compared the same replication of these same viruses in an immunodeficient uh, Vero E6 cells, we found they replicated identically. What this suggests that is that the host response, a likely interferon response, um, is causing this difference in the virus replication, and, and these, res these viruses can re replicate differentially and re respond differentially uh, to uh, antiviral responses. <coughs> we then uh, tested uh, some known antivirals to see uh, if they respond differently. You know, no know antibody responses, they evade and, 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 ca um, and then cause severe disease, but for the non um, spike mediated antiviral responses, can they respond differentially? We used a protease inhibitor. A protease is essential for chopping this polyprotein complex that is formed during the coronavirus replication. So we used the protease inhibitor. One of those compounds was MG132, which has several other functions, but it also has a calpain um, protease function. We used that known inhibitor to test their efficacy. As we can see from this one, compared to untreated uh, wild type SARS-CoV-2 infected mice, the, the, the cells, the cells that are treated with the variant had much lower titers of SARS-CoV-2, even at 0.1 micromolar concentrations compared to um, the untreated or DMSO control treated cells. And we use that both at lower MOI, that is 0.1, and a high MOI of 1 MOI, and we saw a similar trend in, in response to this protease inhibitor treatment. These inhibitors can suppress the virus replication in vitro in immunocompetent cells. We then compare whether these calpin inhibitors or protease inhibitors would be effective in suppressing, whether it's comparable or not comparable or differential uh, against uh, different variants. This is again a wild type variant or wild type virus. And then we compared the antiviral response of this drug in a South African variant, and we found similarly around um, uh, 100 fold reduction in the virus replication at higher concentrations compared to lower concentrations. Similarly, the Brazilian variant, uh, B117 UK variant, and the Delta variants, the replication of these viruses was also suppressed following uh, treatment with the, uh, this calpain, that is protease inhibitor, suggesting that these different variant viruses can be suppressed by using um, a broad spectrum antivirals such as uh, you know, protease inhibitors or calpain or other, so many other protease inhibitors and can be uh, repurposed or used to treat um, suppressed virus replication. With these, some initial studies, we also know one of the main features of work in my lab is to study pathogenesis. We haven't had a good animal model system to study, especially small animal model that we can use to genetically manipulate and study different uh, genes and, and host responses. So uh, we recently um, received a mouse-adopted coronavirus from Dr. Stanley Perman. Uh, we wanted to first test how this mouse-adopted virus, which also incorporates the different mutations that we see in South African variant, the you know, UK variant, as well as in the Brazilian variant, N5O1Y, K483. Uh, those mutations are present in the most adopted, making it more relevant virus. We infected, um, uh, we did not infect or gave PBS, or infected uh, 12 to 14 week B6 mice with the uh, most adopted SARS-CoV-2 with the lethal dose that is, you know, uh, 50,000 PFUs, and we, we observe for weight loss, morbidity, and mortality. As you can see from this figure, uh, around 70% of the mice lost uh, more weight than the, uh, the, uh, the criteria that we had set for the uh, euthanasia, and three of those survived. And as you can see from the survival curve, you know, you know, this mouse adaptive virus can cause uh, severe disease in a, in, in, a, in a standard laboratory mice. This is an advantage because so far we were using what we call as um, K18 mice. This is transgenic mice. One of the disadvantages of that, that, that mouse or system was that there used to be a neurotropic infection, which is not really observed in, in humans. So this would give a, a better system to probe the pathogenesis of this uh, pathogen. So we also observed what, what correlates, what are the correlates of protection or pathology. So one of the features that I work on is you know, inflammatory cells, and we observed that 
increase in inflammatory monocyte macrophage accumulation as well as neutrophil accumulation in the lungs of these mice at different days post-infection. And then does it correlate with the lung pathology? And our, our answer is yes, it does correlate, correlate with lung pathology as observed by um, edema or fibrin deposition uh, in, to some extent. And there is a lot of inflammatory cell accumulation as well as uh, both um, alveolar macrophage as well as interstitial uh, macrophage accumulation in the lungs when we compare that to the naive lung. So this would give a um, really nice system compared to current systems that we have of small models to study the pathogenesis and to test the antiviral drugs. So with this, I would like to conclude by saying that SARS-CoV variant viruses dif replicate differently in, in immunocompetent versus immunodeficient cells. These variant viruses are susceptible to broad spectrum antiviral drugs, and a mouse adapted virus can be used or should be used uh, to study the pathogenesis because the virus, the mouse adapted virus, incorporates the mutations that we commonly observe in several of the human variants of concern. And severe pneumonia correlates with the myeloid cell accumulation uh, and the lung pathology. Um, um, and this mouse model is really good for, to study the pathogenesis. With that, I would like to thank some of lab members. Uh, Muni Salvaraj is a postdoc who has done a lot of the antiviral and virus replication work. Devarati has recently joined my lab and who's doing a really good job. And a DVM student, Titus Patton, and the two more undergraduate students, Lily Brindley and Rachel Justice, who also have done uh, some of the work in the lab. And thanks to my collaborator, my postdoc mentor, Dr. Stanley Perman, for providing the mouse adapter virus, learning do Sunil working here uh, for pathology and other, and, and collaborates Luis and Shibo Jiang. My thanks to uh, Oak Ridge Cobra funding as well for the funding support and BSL3, ABSL OSU facilities and uh, Oak Ridge Immunopathology Corps for their support with the flow cytometry. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Chen Penavar. <laughs> Questions. A very beautiful work in such a short amount of time. So my question is, uh, I know that Dr. Raf Berg lab also has this um, mouse adaptive uh, SARS-CoV-2 strain. Do you know the differences between your um, mouse adaptive strain compared to um, Dr. Raf Berg in terms of the genomic sequences? So I think there are similar um, mutations that, that emerged following the adaptation. Um, I, I haven't clearly looked at it. I think the mutations, some of the mutations are quite similar uh, that emerged in the following adaptation. Uh, that's one thing I know. I think they cause pretty similar disease. They cause severe disease in the old compared to the youngs. Um, and, and if you use six-week old mice, they don't, both of those don't cause severe disease compared to 10 to 12-week old. So this shows that the age-dependent uh, phenotype in these strains. All Thank right. you, Dr. Chan Panama. Thank you. Our next presentation is from Dr. Josh Butcher from the College of Veterinary Medicine. The presentation is entitled Utilization of an Exercise Mimetic as a Buffer Against Influenza. I'm going to move this down. Good afternoon. Um, and good morning or good evening to those of you that joined us virtually and potentially in different time zones. Um, my name is Josh. And um, I want to take a moment and say thank you to Interact for this opportunity to talk to you about some of the newer work that my lab has been doing. Um, and specifically, um, how we're using exercise medics to buffer against viral infection. So a quick thank you to uh, many of the people who actually did the work. So Emily Noonan, specifically, um, in bold, is my DVM PhD student. She's been instrumental in driving this research forward um, and also in driving her own research forward. So if you, if you do happen to see her poster on type 1 diabetes, please uh, feel free to talk to her about it um, outside. And then I have two undergrad students, Blake and Hallie, who have been working with me over the last year that have been doing this, and then our collaborator, Dr. Rudd. 
was crucial in helping us get up and going. And of course, uh, a big thank you to the people who paid for it. So NIH and specifically Oak Ridge, um, they provided me with the uh, pilot funding to do this study. So very grateful for that. So <clears throat> I don't think it's going to come as a huge surprise to this group when I say that exercise is beneficial, right? Exercise is beneficial to you in a variety of different ways, but specifically exercise is protective against viral infection. Now, it's an important point that it's not protective against a person getting infected with a virus, but it is very important in terms of protecting a person against the morbidities that occur with that viral infection and um, early mortality. So you don't have to take my word for it. There are a variety of different papers that demonstrate that regardless of the age that a person is, regardless of the sex that a person has, that if you are, uh, if they're active or if they exercise, that they are going to be protected against the mortality and comorbidities that frequently accompany influenza, uh, excuse me, influenza infection. <clears throat> so if we know that exercise is really good for us, um, what happens when we can't exercise? What about people who are constrained by time, uh, space, or financial limitations? And for the first time, I've updated this slide, what about a pandemic? What about when your gym is closed? Um, of course, I think almost everybody in this room has chosen at some point to go to some kind of professional or grad school. Perhaps you're not hitting the gym quite as frequently as you had hoped. Um, and there are other populations as well. The elderly, uh, those confined to long-term hospital stays, and the morbidly obese. And uh, these populations are simply unable <clears throat> to exercise at a level that conveys cardiovascular benefits. And so what my lab is interested in doing is how do we take the benefits of exercise and provide that to these populations without necessarily increasing activity. So one key thing about exercise is that when you exercise a muscle, it increases both in size, so in mass, and also in function, so typically it gets stronger. So what we do is we manipulate muscle mass. Um, specifically, we augment it, we make it bigger by manipulating a protein called myostatin, or GDF8. So very simply, it's a member of the GDF, uh, GDF uh, excuse me, TGF beta superfamily, and it inhibits muscle growth. So if myostatin goes up in a person or an animal, muscle mass goes down. You can see the specific, um, <clears throat> uh, the specific, uh, the specifics of the interaction there on the right if, in a nice review by Han and Mitch if you're interested. And for those of you that might be exercise physiologists, um, when you inhibit myostatin in most animals, it will upregulate glycolytic muscle fibers. And interestingly, when you look at disease phenotypes and specifically muscle wasting phenotypes, you see that myostatin is upregulated in a large chunk of them. So aging, obesity, AIDS, and specifically look at the one at the bottom, viral infection. <clears throat> and it's downregulated with exercise. Now, I'm not, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. Uh, most of you here have pro are probably familiar with naturally occurring myostatin mutations. So there at the top is the uh, a blue Belgian, double muscled cow. That occurs naturally. Um, and there at the bottom, the dogs are, uh, are, are whippets, if you're familiar with the racing dogs. And there are naturally occurring myostatin mutations, and so the racing whippets frequently have a mutation in myostatin. So this is our experimental paradigm. We have mice with just a normal, with myostatin, just a normal mouse. And then we have a mouse with myostatin deletion, uh, deleted. And we expose these mice to influenza A, uh, PR834. So you can see the dose right there. Um, and we give it to them under light sedation in about 50 microliters um, intranasally. And then we monitor them over uh, five days and then we sacrifice them. And this is kind of a key point. So this particular experiment and what I'm a cardiovascular physio physiologist by training and I'm interested in aging. So the age of the mice that we used here were between 40 or 60 weeks old. So this approximately corresponds to a middle age group um, <clears throat> to a human. So between 40 um, and 60 years of age. So what did we find? The first thing that we found is that these mice get very, very sick. All right, so by day five, if you look at the bar chart, you can look at weight loss. 
And you can see that if the lean control mice shown in red lose about 15% of their body weight, and this is largely mimicked by the mice that also have myostatin deletion. So we're fairly confident that the mice are equally sick. Um, interestingly, when we look at the survival curve, we see that myostatin deletion protects against influenza mortality. So what you can see here is that at the end of day five, about 25% of just our lean controls have, um, have died. And um, interestingly, there has been no mortality at all with myostatin deletion. So then we did, we wanted to look at some of the inflammatory factors that are relevant. So we basically did uh, an RT-PCR screen to look at the transcriptome. So this is in total lung homogenates. So we have not dissected out a specific cell type of interest yet. And I just wanna highlight here, particularly that IL-6 um, and IL-4 are significantly upregulated in our lean wild type mice and that IL-2, MCP-1, and IL-beta are significantly elevated in our myostat knockout infected mice compared to both just a, a normal mouse, which is the wild type, or the wild type infected. We looked at some other inflammatory factors as well. They're listed uh, right there, and they were not significantly different. And I wanna highlight something, that there was this really nice paper a couple years ago by Warren et al who showed very similar matching patterns in the bronchial uh, alveolar lavage fluid in mice that they actually exercised over several weeks. Um, and so we do actually think that in our lean mice, we've actually done a pretty good job of mimicking um, exercise in our mice independent of actual increases in activity. So we did look at uh, oxidative stress and specific uh, specifically the NADPH oxidase family and characterized the three relevant isoforms, one, two, and four. You can see that NOX1 goes up quite a bit um, significantly in the, um, in the myostatin knockout mice and that NOX4 is actually significantly decreased. So there's some kind of dynamic interplay there that we need to continue to work on. So finally, I wanna finish on this very preliminary data. So we actually finished this project up uh, last week so we're interested in looking at obesity and influenza together. You can see that uh, overall obesity is associated with increasing viral infection rates and the severity of the disease. There's some details listed right there. But it was in the 2009 um, H1N1 pandemic that obesity actually emerged as an independent risk factor. So it increases the risk of getting H1N1, it increases hospitalization, and it increases the infection severity, although the specific mechanisms that drive that are unknown. So what did we do? It's the exact same experimental paradigm, except for this time we used an, an obese mouse model, with just a normal control, a DBDB mouse, and then again, that same obese mouse with myostatin deleted. If you're not familiar with the DBDB mouse, it possesses a dysfunctional leptin receptor, it means it's chronically hyperphagic. This animal never stops eating. So by 12 weeks of age, the DBDB mouse, and 12 weeks is about a, a young, considered young adult, um, the DBDB mouse is a model of metabolic syndrome. It's well characterized to mimic the human condition of obesity. Um, these animals are type two diabetic, they are hypertensive, they have vascular disease and uh, renal dysfunction. And again, Using the exact same middle aged, we expose these mice to um, intranasal infection with influenza. Again, we see significant weight loss in both groups. You may notice that it's not quite as much as the lean mice, and I will tell you that the, the DBDB phenotype is overwhelming. I've never actually seen these mice lose weight unless they are very, very sick or they're dying. So the fact that we even get between a, a five and a six percent decrease in weight over five days to me actually tells me that these mice are indeed very sick. <clears throat> and interestingly, you can see uh, it's not quite significant. The P is uh, 0 0.008, but you can see that we have about a 50% increase in mortality in our obese controls. And that again, remarkably, we have uh, no, uh, no mortality with myostatin deletion in obese mice. So uh, this should hopefully give you a little bit of an idea of what uh, Emily will be doing next week. Um, but anyway, that, that is currently where we are at. Uh, thank you for your time, and I will take any questions.
Thank you, Dr. Butcher. Uh, questions from the audience? Very interesting talk. I'm uh, fascinated about those findings. So my question is uh, uh, for those uh, mouse infected by the obese mice by, mm -hmm. infected by the, the virus. I look at the, the weight loss is about less than 10%. Mm -hmm. Does, do, those, do those mouse have other symptoms that cause those mortality? mortality? Those, because I saw the mice die from the infection. Uh, yes, so actually, um, similar to what Craig presented, when we look at the, like the coat score activity, you know, the eyes um, that he developed for the cat, uh, Dr. Rudd also has a similar method of quantifying mouse infection. And so we, we have all of that. The mice, uh, I'm not 100%, I'm 100 convinced that the mice are infected. Um, that I don't worry about too much. Um, I will tell you that we, we give them all the same dose. So the obese mice do, at least in terms of by mass, receive a lesser dose. But I think that would technically be the same way that a human would, would experience, right? It's not massive. You don't get a bigger dose. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Okay. You didn't show this on the same slide, but do the obese mice uh, die more readily from influenza than a, a lean control? Um, it, it won't be uh, statistically significant just because of the N, but uh, yes, it's about 25, 27% in lean and closer to 50% in obese. One more question. Great talk, Josh, as always. So uh, with the H1N1 uh, knockout mice, you show increased inflammation, increased oxidative stress, right? Uh, I'm sorry, with the H1N1 knockout mice? Yes, the infected mice. Oh, you mean the, um, yes, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, yes, with the so, influenza, yeah. Which I think is a very interesting finding. But I'm still struggling, what is the molecular mechanism by which knocking on? That's an excellent question. Um, and the, the easy answer is, is, is we don't know, right? Uh, if you look at some of the inflammatory factors, it looks like somehow we've changed the immune response. Specifically, the, um, it looks like the T cells are somehow better protecting against influenza. We haven't specifically narrowed it down to a T cell. That study's probably coming up next. The other aspect of, and I think you know this because I know what you study, Dr. Lacombe, is, is it glucose? Um, does having a better, or does being able to better utilize glucose allow you to better protect against viral infection? So in that case, we do know that these, you know, myostatin knockout mice, either lean or obese, have this very large metabolic sink. Um, they are not diabetic, and they are highly resistant. Um, as you've seen some of the data, they are highly resistant to perturbations in glucose. And so the question is, is because these, does having this larger metabolic sink allow for better utilization of glucose and does it end up preventing against some of the, is that the link for preventing um, uh, against the severity of influenza infection? Likely plays a key role. We can talk about that further later. Yes. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Butcher. I look forward to getting my exercise by pill soon. All right. <laughs> Very good. Uh, we're going to have a slight deviation in our uh, program. Dr. Biggs will announce here. We want to give our presenters all the opportunity to have a photograph with Dr. Boitler, if you so choose. If you would like that, you may go out to the lobby. Uh, we, we apologize. We've had to, again, make a slight change in our schedule, and we apologize to our virtual attendees for that. We'll have a slight break. Uh, about 10 minutes, we'll get that taken care of. And uh, don't worry, we'll probably go ahead and speed on through the remainder of the presentations without taking a break later on today. So thank you for hanging with us, and we will see you back in 10 minutes.
Okay, we shall reconvene uh, now with the uh, next uh, presentation. Uh, before uh, that, I just wanted to uh, say thank you very much to uh, Dr. Biggs uh, just for her excellent uh, work in uh, keeping things organized and also keeping the program moving. So thank you, Dr. Biggs. Our next presentation comes from Kelly Harrison uh, from the College of Veterinary Medicine. Her presentation is entitled, Impaired Glucocorticoid Receptor Function Reduces HSV-1 Reactivation from Latency. Uh, thank you guys, and thank you to everyone who decided to stay for this afternoon's session. Um, like he just mentioned, today I'm going to talk to you about how impairing the glucocorticoid receptor may have a role in reducing HSV-1, or herpes simplex virus 1, reactivation from latency. Um, so herpes simplex virus is a neurotropic double-stranded DNA virus. It infects mucosal epithelial cells and then very rapidly uh, invades the sensory neurons and can travel to the central nervous system. Um, it is one of the more common human viral infections. The NIH estimates that by the time individuals are 65 years old, about 80% of adults in the United States will test seropositive for HSV-1. It, uh, it does establish lifelong infections and causes recurrent outbreaks, and these recurrent outbreaks make it the leading cause of infectious blindness worldwide due to corneal scarification and stromal herpes keratitis. Uh, it's also responsible for sporadic encephalitis with mortality rates over 70%, and even when antiviral therapies are applied, there's still long-term neurological complications. There's also a growing body of evidence that HSV-1 may be implicated in Alzheimer's disease. And all of these are due to the signature latency and reactivation cycle that herpes simplex virus has. So craniofacial infections with HSV-1 establish latency within the sensory neurons of the trigeminal ganglia, or cranial nerve 5. Once latency is established, there's very minimal viral protein production and even less progeny production. However, there is abundant production of a latency-associated transcript. This transcript encodes for six microRNAs, two small non-coding RNAs, and then several other transcripts, which mainly function to be anti-apoptotic, or to keep those neurons alive that the virus is residing in. And while all of this is known about latency, the triggers for reactivation from latency are very poorly understood. However, it is commonly accepted that stress increases reactivation from latency. But stress in and of itself is a fairly ambiguous term. Both chronic and acute stress activate the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis of the brain and release corticosteroids known as glucocorticoids. These are the, hormone steroid, the steroid hormones that give you those feelings of fight or flight. So you get the increased blood pressure, you start to sweat, uh, your heart starts racing, etc. Synthetic glucocorticoids are also among the most widely prescribed drugs, and these include your prednisones, your hydrocortisones, and the one I'm going to be talking about today, dexamethasone, which I'm going to call dex. So once you have these glucocorticoids released from the brain, they can bind to either the mineral corticoid receptor or the glucocorticoid receptor, which I'm going to focus on. This hormone receptor complex then enters the nucleus of a cell and can alter transcription. The target genes for this complex make up 20% of the human genome, and GR is expressed in almost every cell of the body. It's also absolutely essential for life in that homozygous knockout mice are embryonically lethal. The glucocorticoid receptor itself has three major domains, a C-terminal ligand binding domain, which binds your glucocorticoids, your DNA binding domain that has two zinc finger motifs to bind uh, glucocorticoid response elements on those target genes, also known as GREs, and the N-terminal transactivation domain, which is arguably the most dynamic portion of the protein because it has seven different serine residues. Among these serine residues, Serine 211 has been shown to have some of the highest activity. 
At phosphorylation, it's shown to interact with lysine 206, causing a conformational change of the protein, opening up that DNA binding pocket. It has a robust activity in the presence of glucocorticoids, including dexamethasone, like I mentioned earlier. It has rapid nuclearization, and studies have shown that if you mutate serine 211 to an alanine, you reduce the function of the glucocorticoid receptor by nearly 75%. But what does this have to do with herpes virus? So as I mentioned, stress increases reactivation from latency, and we in other labs have shown that both physical and psychological stressors rapidly stimulate HSV-1 replication and reactivation from latency, and it's a very early response to stress when using the synthetic corticosteroid dexamethasone. It was previously thought that application of dexamethasone induced reactivation because of its immunosuppressive properties, but these immunosuppressive properties are a very late response to stress, so there has to be something else at play here. We have also shown that using a GR antagonist blocks virus reactivation from latency in latently infected mice, and trigeminal ganglia from mice that have been latently infected with HSV-1 express more glucocorticoid receptor than trigeminal ganglia from mice treated with dex giving us our central hypothesis that an impaired glucocorticoid function will reduce HSV-1 reactivation from latency. To test the study directly, we teamed up with Drs. John Sidlowski and Bob Oakley at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. They developed a humanized mouth model in which the mouse GR replaces, sorry, in which the human GR replaces the mouse GR, and they've also developed that serine to alanine mutation at serine 211. They sent us a couple of these mice, we set up a breeding colony, and once we got enough litter mates, we set up an infection study using ocular infections with the highly neurovirulent HSV-1 strain McRae. Starting two days post-infection, up to 10 days, we swabbed the eyes to test for acute virus shedding, um, roughly until about day 10 and 15. This is sort of the peak of virus shedding and acute infection. And then every five days after that, we swabbed the eyes to test for lat latency. Roughly 30 days post-infection, the animals are operationally defined as latently infected, at which point they were sacrificed. We harvested the trigeminal ganglia and ran qPCR studies and explant-induced reactivation. Looking at the acute infection, so this is where we swabbed the eyes and plaqued for HSV-1 shedding, we can see right off the bat, we have the male S211A and female S211A. These are the mutant uh, GR mice and then the C57 control animals. Uh, both the male and female stopped shedding roughly around six days post-infection, whereas both of our controls continued shedding until day 10. So the mutants already have a, an early stop in shedding compared to our control animals. Further, the male S211As had a reduced amount of shedding in virus compared to their C57 controls. For our explant-induced reactivation, 30 days post-infection when the animals are operationally defined as latency, we sacrifice and harvest the trigeminal ganglia, incubate it in cell culture media with 2% stripped FBS. This stripped FBS has been passed over a charcoal filter to remove lipid-based molecules, growth hormones, and other corticosteroids that are just found naturally in FBS. And then we add in the synthetic corticosteroid dexamethasone to mimic a stress response specific for the GR to activate reactivation. We then plaque daily for infectious virus to test those reactivation levels. As you can see here, in light blue, we have our male S211s. In dark blue, we have the male C57 controls. Light pink, we have the female S211s. In dark pink, we have the C female C57 controls. And while the males all seemed to match up with their C57 control, the females did not, reaching five log lower reactivation levels by day nine. So there's significantly imp re impaired reactivation in females when the glucocorticoid receptor is impaired. We then ran RTQPCR using RNA from the latently infected TG and primers against that LAT transcript that I mentioned earlier. We compared our LAT expression to GAP-DH, normalizing to a housekeeping gene, and then equilibrated everything to the kidney. Because we did an ocular infection with HSV-1, the infection should be uh, localized to the brain, so we shouldn't see any virus in the kidney. That way we can normalize everything to um, non-infected tissue. So here you can see if we set our kidney to one, we do have LAT expression in both our S211A females and males, so it's not like 
knocking out the GR inhibits infection entirely. However, if you get rid of that kidney data, you can see better that there is a significant reduction in LAT expression among females where that GR is impaired, uh, which may be why we saw such a dramatic reduction in, let me get that out of the way, such a dramatic reduction uh, in late reactivation from latency from the explants. So just to conclude, we've shown that a mutation of GR, that serine 211 to an alanine, impaired virus shedding during acute infection for both males and females. They both stopped shedding roughly four days earlier than controls. There was also significantly less virus in males compared to the C57 controls. Explant-induced reactivation was significantly decreased in female mice compared to both C57 controls and the male both GR uh, mutated animals and C57 controls, and our RTQ-PCR showed significantly less LAT transcripts from TG of females compared to the males with no LAT in the control tissues, the kidneys. I do want to state that this is all very preliminary data. We're in the process of repeating all of the studies with all of the controls. We're going to be harvesting more TG to run immunohistochemistry to assess viral protein expression during latency reactivation. And as even this animal model is relatively novel, we're going to be running a lot of neuroinflammation studies because these have not been published on before either. With that, I'd like to thank everyone in our lab, my advisor, Dr. Clinton Jones, Dr. John Sidlowski, um, his co-worker, Dr. Robert Oakley, who provided the mice for us, my grad student, Vanessa Santos, who's been um, essential when it came to the breeding colonies, everyone else in the lab, and our former members who also helped me with our mouse breeding colonies, and I would love to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Questions? What intriguing work there, and beautiful talk. Thanks. Um, so, your results are consistent with two different scenarios, I think. One in which the latent viruses are dropping out because they're not e expressing the, the uh, LAT. Mm -hmm. So they're, it's not a defect specifically in reactivation, but there just aren't viruses left to reactivate versus actually a specific defect in reactivation. Can you comment on that? Um, yes. So I believe your question is, because there's a decrease in the LAT transcript as well, is it potentially that the virus itself is not infecting as properly? Or like once it infects and it goes latent, then it's not surviving. Then it's not surviving. Maybe. Exactly. And that's one thing that we're looking at. So um, when we harvested the trigeminal ganglia this time, we collected everything for RNA. Um, we also tried to isolate the DNA as well to make sure that there were equal levels of viral DNA there to make sure that it's not a clearance of infection. Unfortunately, since everything was collected in trisol, my DNA recovery wasn't as good as it should have been. So again, when we repeat these studies, we're going to separate things out a little bit better. That way I do get that DNA. Um, I, I, if we run just regular endpoint PCR on the cDNA generated from the RNA, there's still um, the glycoprotein Bs and things like that. So it does appear that there is still virus there. Um, the question as to whether there are equal levels of virus reaching latency or whether some of it is being cleared still needs to be answered. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Thank you. Our next presentation comes from Dr. Jimmy Weaver from the College of Arts and Sciences. The name of the title of the presentation is The Development of Controthermodynamic Catalysis Applications to Photoclick Reactions and Unfavorable Isomerizations. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Okay. Um, uh, uh, well done. Uh, and I'm from the Department of Chemistry as well within the College of Arts and Sciences. So if anyone had any concerns that uh, their, their talks weren't applied enough to be part of this, um, you know, I, I should be able to help you put that fear to rest. Um, but, uh, and, ah. and hopefully um, you guys will still be awake in the end of my 13 minutes. But, uh, you know, first I should thank the Interact uh, uh, Committee uh, for this opportunity to get to talk to you. I've had a number of really enjoyable conversations today uh, that I look forward to following up on. So, um, at, you, you may ask why is an organic chemist here um, in, in this 
you know, talk. And, and I would argue that, uh, you know, at the heart of m almost every scientific discipline is chemistry, you know, and b the need to make molecules. And so, um, you know, that's, that's really at the heart of my own uh, interest, right, is how do we uh, synthesize molecules? And so if you start to ask that question and you agree that it's a worthwhile question, um, you know, many people approach this by uh, trying to develop a ca catalysis. And so here on this scenario on the left, I've drawn a little cartoon in which there's an electron transfer between A and B. Uh, such that this happens. And in this case, it's a favorable one. Um, and on the right side, there's a, a, a scenario in which that electron transfer is an unfavorable one, energetically speaking. Okay, and, and so catalysis, if you develop catalysis, that works for the system on the left, uh, and that's because it's favorable. Uh, you, you, because of the principle of microscopic reversibility, it means that anything you do to come up with an alternative pathway that's lower in energy will necessarily favor the backwards reaction too, um, as long as uh, it's a reversible reaction like that. And so uh, in these situations, really, you only need to consider developing synthesis for uh, scenarios that are like the left side here. Um, uh, when, you know, if you want to catalyze a process that might enable new synthesis for a scenario like this on the right, you need to come up with another strategy, one that doesn't involve microscopic reversibility. And so um, photo excitation is one of the ways in which we can actually do this because it's, it's not allowed to reverse back in the same pathway. And so that gives you a chance to both um, catalyze uh, uh, in, or exergonic processes as well as endergonic processes like this one on the right. Uh, and that's because we can't come directly back down. And so now there's an actual barrier between, um, you know, this process. Okay. And so arguably within my field, this scenario on the right has been grossly ignored and underdeveloped. And so we use uh, or limit ourselves to visible light uh, processes uh, and, and don't go into higher energy wavelengths, but we like to use this iridium-based photocatalyst. It's an 18 electron complex. It's tris cyclometallated. Uh, effectively, it's like a yellow brick uh, that doesn't do much of anything until you shine a, a photon on it, in which case it becomes a, a singlet, but then very rapidly becomes a triplet again. This triplet gets it's used for all types of really cool uh, redox chemistry uh, that happens, so oxidative and reductive. Uh, but it, the mechanism that's really at work here within the work that I'm going to show you is this uh, substrate sensitization pathway. And so in this scenario, what you see is actually a double electron transfer. This is known as a dexter energy transfer. Um, Okay, and so we utilized this mechanism several years ago to show that we could take and uh, take just a blue light and cause it to isomerize alkenes in the contrathermodynamic direction towards their cis alkenes. So these are isomers of one another that only vary in their geometrical, um, you know, alkene um, geometry there. And so a lot of very smart people had really thought through the more traditional uh, approaches, which are to start with higher energy molecules and develop catalytic pathways that allow them to get to here, but not go over that second barrier to the more stable molecule. Uh, ours was different in the sense that we were starting from the more stable molecule and using light to actually drive it to this other way. And we were, showed that we were able to do this in synthetically useful uh, ways. So this is Kamal G, one of my first graduate students, now a research scientist at PPD. Uh, but what he showed us is that we could take and, and that it was a very general, nice, clean reaction that could be used really well. All you had to do was start with the trans and a little bit of dusting of your photocatalyst, and that would allow you to isomerize it to the cis isomer there. And that was really great. Uh, we studied the mechanism a lot. I don't have time to go into that, but effectively you might ask why it does this, and it really comes down to the fact that it's easier to re-excite this molecule than it is the Z isomer, the cis isomer uh, there. And so it's been kind of fun to sit back uh, and watch others join in on this chemistry from around the world. Um, and, you know, this has recently culminated in, in Professor Gilmore at the University of Munster writing a chem review over the reaction that we started and developed here. Uh, but it, this, you know, from that time, we kind of started thinking about, you know, you know there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, overlap between what we're doing and what uh, nature does in photosynthesis, right? So, um, you know, to the first approximation, she takes carbon dioxide and water plus light and makes sugars out of it, okay? And so if you think about it, uh, the, the spontaneous reaction uh, is not this way. In fact, if I hold a match to this, it goes this direction, right? It burns. Um, and so that is very much in the contrathermodynamic direction. Uh, but one thing that nature doesn't do is actually to... Um, she, she doesn't actually do this directly through a photochemical process right here. Instead, it's a very indirect process. And there's several takeaways. Uh, I don't want to do anyone a disservice, but if we generalize um, things that we can take away from the photosynthetic synthesis 
or photosynthesis and, and the study of these systems is that really nature is highly conserved and pretty much only uses two photochemical reactions. Uh, for all the biological products that she wants to make, there's really only, you know, they can be traced back to these two photochemical reactions that are used to make ATP and NADPH, which are the uh, energetic currency used to really drive all photo or all uh, biological processes. Um, and, and so the beauty of it is that ATP um, can uh, be, be endlessly recycled um, as well as NADPH and, and both of these give off uh, a lot of energy. And so those are some of the key strategies. But we started asking ourselves, could we devise a synthetic uh, equivalent to photosynthesis? And so uh, here was an energy diagram of uh, our system where we start with the transalkene and we get out the cisalkene. Uh, we, we really wanted to know, could we harvest more energy? So out of this, we were really only harvesting two and a half to five kcals out of the 55 to 60 kcals that were available at the transition state. So we thought a straightforward way to potentially uh, accomplish this would be to put our alkene in, embedded inside of a ring, a small ring like this. And now when this undergoes isomerization to this one, uh, some of this strain energy or this energy is captured in the form of strain because these bond angles and distances are really distorted from their ideal bond angles. And this species would be a longer lived species that we could then utilize um, to exploit, kind of like ATP and NADPH. And so this has been a really fruitful area for my research group, um, you know, and I'll tell you a little bit about this one where we developed a visible light mediated bioconjugation strategy, so also worked by Kamaljeet. He started by studying these phenylcyclooctene species up here on the top left, and indeed he showed us that uh, we could take and put on, you know, by shining uh, visible light on it, we could uh, isomerize it to about 30% of the, the trans isomer. Uh, this was um, kind of remarkable uh, in the sense that it's 13 kcals in energy above its relaxed isomer. And so, um, you know, this translates into about 10 orders of magnitude perturbation from equilibrium. And so from a, you know, a physical perspective, that's actually pretty cool. Uh, from a synthetic perspective, no sin decent chemist wants to actually isolate 20, 30 percent yields. Uh, and so we looked at another uh, approach. That was to actually add a reagent that could react with the strained isomer. So that's what this benzyl azide species is. And that would allow us to make this triazoline as the, the strain species is actually formed. Uh, and, you know, uh, that, that actually worked. We were able to consume the entire thing in three to five days. So then we said, what if we make it a smaller cycle? It should be more strained. Um, and what would happen? What if we went to the six-membered ring? How strained would that be? Forty, you know, it's expected to be 45 to 55 kcals above an energy. So we were really excited with the cycloheptene systems. It went down to 16 hours. Uh, but then when we looked at the cyclohexene, unfortunately, it didn't do anything. Five days, it just stares at you. Um, and so this is probably understood uh, most easily by looking at the half-lives. It's a little bit of an apples and oranges comparison, but what you can see is the transcyclohexene uh, is probably a lot, um, or much more short-lived uh, species. And that's what's really killing us or stopping us from being able to utilize that species. Okay, so of the cycloheptene system that uh, reacted to form these triazolines, there was about, um, you know, a, a considerable amount that formed this other byproduct, this 2 plus 2 product, which I, I point out only to say that this is kind of a unique reaction that, that is enabled by making uh, these strained alkenes. So normally a 2 plus 2 is a, a, is a forbidden process, or at least that's what it's said to be. But it turns out because these alkenes are so um, uh, strained and because they sterically are actually more accessible than you might expect, they can get to this really contorted configuration that they have to to be able to uh, undergo rearrangement. Okay, uh, so we were able to, um, you know, uh, show this. It was a pretty cool example, synthetically fairly useful. We were able to take one stereo center here and use it to control six contiguous stereo center, which uh, is kind of a, a, an accomplishment. Uh, so to speak. Okay, but back on task uh, to talking about the bioconjugation stuff. So, uh, you know, people, I've talked to a couple people today about this idea that want to be able to, to look at their biomolecules. And so one of the strategies people do is to put an azide in their molecule through site-specific mutagenesis or something along these lines. Um, uh, and then uh, th these things can go along for the ride. And then when you want to know something about your biomolecule or pull it down or do any other type of fun reporting that chemistry can enable us to do, um, you need a way to react selectively with that. And so this is uh, this bioorthogonal uh, click chemistry here. And so the strategy, though, to get this to happen, because this is usually part of a very large molecule with slow kinetics, uh, is to strain the alkyne and perpetually make it more and more strained. And so for 10 years, Carolyn Bertosi and, and, and people like her worked on making more and more strained alkynes. The downside to this is that the more strained your alkyne becomes, 
the more difficult it is to handle this molecule. And so that's inherently a severe limitation. They don't really like to talk about that. Uh, so we began to ask ourselves, could we develop a photocatalytically activated coupling reagent um, that we could use? There were a lot of potential advantages, but there are also a lot of potential uh, disadvantages or challenges that we would have to overcome. Uh, long story short, I wouldn't be telling you about it if we couldn't overcome them. Uh, so uh, here is a little summary of what has actually been done. And so we're not the first ones to say, let's use light to make a reactive intermediate. And so there's been some work uh, by uh, Lynn and Popik and Joe Fox. This one even reaches into the visible region. And so that's great because it doesn't, isn't destructive. Uh, but our system was a little different than all of these. And that's because in all three of these systems, what's happening is effectively you're creating a, a reactive intermediate that has no outlet. So effectively you're letting the lion out of the cage. If it doesn't find its reactive partner, something's getting consumed uh, in this process. Uh, ours is a little different in the sense that yes, we use light to strain it, but it also has a way to relax back down to the unstrained, unreactive form uh, and effectively just gives off a little bit of heat to the solvent. Uh, that is, if it doesn't find the, the, the coupling partner that you wanted it to react with. And so that makes it really unique in that regard. Okay, uh, so we... Uh, studied this system, and I don't really have a whole lot of time to go into that, but it evolved from the phenylcycloheptene into this benzocycloheptene, where this is, ring is fused to the other ring. Um, and, and it turns out that this was a much better uh, substrate, uh, and uh, it was much better, but for all the uh, wrong reasons, or at least mm. not the reasons I thought it would be better. Uh, fortunately, I had computational uh, colleagues that were able to help me understand uh, why it was working better. Uh, so that's, that's science for you. But, uh, long story short, it also fortuitously didn't have that 2 plus 2 problem that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, here is a crystal structure. Uh, here you see the benzyl group, that's this group right here, and then the three nitrogens along there, and then you see the trans relationship there that you see right there. And so this is definitely coming from the, the trans benzocycloheptene that's formed in situ. Okay, we studied the kinetics, we optimized the procedure to make this a very fast reaction, um, and so we wanted to try our hand at, you know, doing it on a biomolecule. So what, uh, we reached around for some protein that we had, and we grabbed some insulin, and we unselectively put this azide group on it, uh, and then we were able to take, and at ambient temperatures, um, with open to air uh, and blue lights, we put our uh, benzocycloheptene group on there um, to uh, basically complete the conjugation. Here we have a biotin tag on there just to demonstrate the types of things that you can do. And so I uh, got to learn a lot of new techniques, but we can see that the insulin's not blowing apart through this gel. Um, and we followed that by mass spec. Okay, I told you that cyclohexene didn't work. It just stared at us. So this is work by a recent graduate, John Day, uh, who uh, questioned whether it was a matter of not forming the trans cyclohexene, uh, which is what kind of textbooks suggest is not possible, uh, but, or whether it was a matter of we couldn't react with it fast enough. And so he moved his nucleophile onto the molecule. So that should speed things up. At least that was the thought. And long story short, it actually does work, and it works really well. And so this is actually kind of remarkable because this really enables new types of uh, chemistry to occur. So uh, normally, if you were just to take an acid and try to, you know, catalyze this oxygen bond adding to the carbon bond here, you would just see elimination of the hydroxy group. So it wouldn't do the chemistry that you would hope it would do. Uh, instead, by going through a transcyclohexene, we actually cause this alkene to become more basic um, in, in the acid base sense uh, than, than the alcohol group. And so we're changing the, the nature of the polarization or what's an oompalong type uh, reaction there. I'll skip over that for now, for time's sake. Okay, uh, the real takeaway here, and this is a busy slide, I apologize, especially for the amount of time that I have to spend on it. Um, if you want to react with a cyclohexene, a trans-cyclohexene, the real key to this is that you've got to overcome that short lifetime. Uh, it's best if you can uh, have something that is already interacting with it. And so formic acid, in this case, uh, is basically already coordinated to it when it's basically born. Um, and so by... Uh, Having it already there, it's able to protonate it before it has time to relax to anything else. Okay, uh, more recently, you know, we've continued kind of investigating what happens when you make these highly strained molecules. Uh, we moved our alcohol group over simply one carbon, uh, and then other kind of crazy stuff happens. We like this because this gets, these are very easy to make starting materials through a classic process. And so this is work by Rokaya, who's now a, a PhD student at UNC, and Eric Lance, who just finished with his master's here. Uh, but effectively, we take this molecule right here, which has one vinyl signal, uh, and we get another molecule out that has the same mass. Uh, but if you look here at the <coughs> proton, what you see is that it has two vinyl signals. And so we were a little perplexed by that. So it turns out that we're breaking this carbon-carbon bond right there, and it is um, 
you know, that, that's an unusual reaction to say the very least. An unactivated carbon-carbon bond doesn't usually really do this, but it shows how we can take and, and take, you know, classic chemistry right here and then add uh, light to get it to go in a whole nother direction that we've never actually been to before. And so, let me finish up here. Let's talk about it. So, in uh, the big picture of things, uh, what we want to do in synthesis, uh, you know, the last 200 years or so, chemists have been figuring out how to do synthesis really well. Uh, but what we always do is start with energy rich molecules and we work towards more complex molecules. You go down this energetic staircase. Uh, but what we're really trying to do is kind of mimic nature and what she's done over the last five billion years uh, and work the other direction, where we take. Um, you know, energy poor molecules and build sophisticated molecules out of that. And so this could really upend how we do synthesis and how we think about things, how you think about carbon dioxide, for instance, um, you know, as that would now become a really valuable uh, uh, entity. So, um, you know, the keys to doing this, as I see it, are capturing visible light energy, converting it to usable energy, and converting uh, coupling reactions uh, and energy schemes together where we figure out how to mimic ATP's uh, consumption uh, and then ultimately recycling those species and so it's really the last two where I think all the work is uh, you know still is to be done but that's kind of our vision uh, for where we're going with this and and hopefully well stay tuned hopefully there's a lot of work in this direction over the next few years but with that I need to thank uh, my group and they're the ones that do all the hard work I just get to talk about it uh, and thank funding agencies especially the NIH which has funded us through two generations now um, and so uh, I'm very grateful for that and for all of you guys for your attention Anyway, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Weaver. I will say I'm sure everyone in the room values uh, the collaboration across disciplines uh, and a uh, very great thing to have a chemist uh, in the room. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any uh, questions? If not, we'll move on to our next speaker. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Weaver. Our next presenter is Dr. Joshua Moya. The title of his presentation is Validation of a Novel, novel uh, Adam T513 Substrate to Characterize Patients with Thrombotic Thrombocytopenia Purpura. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank you, the Interactive Symposium Committee, for inviting me to come and present some of the work that we are doing in our laboratory. Uh, again, I want to pre, uh, introduce my lab at um, Center for Health Sciences in Tulsa. Uh, my laboratory focused on thrombotic and cardiovascular disease. So today I'm going to talk about um, some of the work that I started at the Washington University School of Medicine before I moved last year to uh, Tulsa. And um, uh, we are trying to seek FDA approval for Adam TS-13 activity assay uh, for clinical use. Uh, let me do introduction about Adam TS13. Adam TS13 is a plasma enzyme with a protein structure shared among the Adam TS family. Adam TS is acronym for endosencrine and like metaprotease with the thromboponding type 1 repeat. And that's the structure. You can see that the structure there's metaprotease, thromboponding, and we have thromboponding, then we have desencrine. The and there are 19 members of this family, so this is member number 13. So this is a, the Adam TS-13 is a not a zymogen. It's active, secreted, and it's dependent on zinc and calcium ions. So uh, what's the function of Adam TS-13? There's only one known biological uh, substrate for Adam TS-13, and that substrate is von Willebrand factor. So this cartoon shows that something that affects everyone. So um, if you, there's a, a vascular injury, we, are, we bleed, and then all of a sudden we see that there is a, the, um, the repair, uh, there's a repair on our wound. So what happens is that uh, von Humboldt factor uh, tethered platelets at the sites of vascular injury, and then that causes, uh, that initiates the uh, congestion cascade to form vibrant clot or, or plug. So we, we see that the endothelial cells, Adam TS-13, and uh, um, you can see that there was that VDAF air platelet aggregates. So what happens if the function of Adam TS-13 activity is impaired? So this question shows that um, Adam TS13 uh, regulates uh, VDAF-F plated aggregates. On the top here, we see that it can able to fragment the VDAF-F uh, plated aggregates. And if there's no Adam TS13 activity, we have this VDAF-F uh, aggregates or clots. And that's what we call uh, uh, micro, that causes what we call microvascular thrombosis or TTP. And the simplest way to find about Adam TS13 activity is just to get pure VDAF-F and subjected to health plasma proteolysis. 
On the top there, we can see that uh, uh, VDAF-F can form monomers and can be reduced to a monomer um, by Adam T13. In a patient with the TTP, which is something that I'm going to reduce uh, the next slide, we see that uh, if you subject VDAF-F proteases uh, to, this, um, uh, to the VDAF-F, you can't see that the monomers are reduced to monomers. And therefore, those patients have low Adam T13 activity. So what is TTP? Uh, this is a, um, I know most people, this is kind of a new term. So TTP is a sort of von Willmann factor proteolysis. Uh, classic pendant of this disease is microangiopic, hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, neurology dysfunction, you know, disease and fever. And you can see this is a blood smear, and you can see this is a fragmented lead blood cells. Uh, they push through themselves through the blood clots. Uh, it's a very rare disease, uh, four per million incidents, strikes mainly young adult women, if not untreated, it has mortality rate of more than 90%. So the uh, TTP can be classified by two, uh, two types. There is uh, acquired and then there is uh, a congenital. Uh, congenital is allegedly acquired autoimmune, whereby the body produces antibodies that attack or um, impair the function of Adam TS13. And I come down to the diagnosis. The diagnosis, both acquired and congenital, is the Adam TS13 deficiency, less than 5%. But also for the uh, acquired TTP, we're also looking at the inhibitory auto antibodies. Both have a low plated number. The treatment is quite different. Uh, um, congenital, we have plasma infusion, and we have recombinant uh, human Adam TS13. Right now, it's in phase three clinical trial. Uh, acquired, there is more complicated uh, um, therapy like plasma exchange, uh, lituximab, um, And because of time, I won't able to go to those uh, uh, the treatment options. But now let's come back to the diagnosis. I said that Adam TS13, especially the low activity correlates with the diagnosis of TTP. So um, when it comes to von Wumban factor, it's also a multi-domain protein like Adam TS13. And there's only one domain that I'm going to focus, that is A2, because it contains the cryptic bond that's cleaved by Adam TS13. And scientists have taken advantage of this bond by getting um, a peptide, which we call VW73 peptide, uh, and it contains this thylosine methion bond, which is cleaved by Adam TS13. And this peptide has been adopted for either for LISA or FRETS. And I'll be talking about FRETS many times. FRETS is fluorescence, resonance, energy transfer. So, um, so there are a number of uh, acids that have come for LISA or FRETS based on this peptide. And I'll be talking mostly on FRETS based acids. So when I came to the lab, when I joined uh, this uh, field uh, about 10 years ago, uh, there was um, one substrate or acid that was very popular, and that was FRETS VW73. VW73 means that it's that peptide derived from A2 domain of von Wuhlen factor. But I found that although it was most popular, it has some mutations, uh, such as the, um, there, was a lot, um, there was some dilution, which caused some decrispasis, uh, it was subject to interference from plasma proteins and compounds such as hemoglobin, bilirubin, and that also impaired the pro impaired product detection. And also, they had limited sensitivity, especially for Adam TS13 inhibitors. And these inhibitors are autoantibodies. So, I hypothesize that if you can have Adam TS13 substrate uh, compatible with undiluted plasma, would overcome these mutations. So, I developed and validated uh, what we call FRETS RV-1 all um, simply human 71, which is uh, um, made from uh, the eight domain of human, von human factor, but this, uh, this one, instead of 73 amino acids, is made of 71. So this um, substrate is a near infrared fluorogenic Adam C13 substrate. And why is infrared? Because the plasma is near transparent, uh, in near, near, in near infrared. And it's just conjugated the front four, uh, DALA 633. And it has a quenger, which is QC1, which is a broad range quenger, 500 to 800 nanometers. Its peptide background is, background is the recombinant WVFA2 uh, peptide. And we use conjugation chemists that uh, uh, Dr. Weaver was talking about just uh, a few minutes ago here. So the, so, Sorry about that. So for the first 71, or this human 71, uh, it just takes about 60 minutes. 
and we can measure about the activity uh, using a diluted pl plasma up to 100 microliters, and also we measure the inhibitor titer in terms of the IC50, which can enable to standardize. So we have, you can see that inset is calibration curve, so you can do interpretation. When, if, for example, you have a test plasma, you can measure the, uh, the activity of test plasma and then exploit it from the uh, uh, calibration curve. And uh, we have done this human 71 uh, for validation and everything, and I've used this uh, 71 to screen patients with the, who are suspected of, of TTP at Washington University uh, School of Medicine uh, between 2012 to 2017. And we found that only one in four patients had TTP. So um, the rest did not have, because they have the other material that in more than 10%. So, but today I'm not going to talk about this particular uh, uh, substrate, that's seven, uh, human 71. I'm going to give you something else uh, a little bit, because this was far, we found it from, from something very different, because we were trying to do something, structure function of Adam that in activity from other species. So from this, I uh, want you to focus just the first two um, peptides. This is human 71, and then we came to find that there's um, also a peptide or substrate made from Cardo von Wooden factor A to domain. So uh, Cardo first 71 or Cardo 71 give us from the human 71 by 13 amino acids. So what's, what's very unique about this Cardo 71 compared to human 71, which we showed that it was working quite uh, perfect. We found that if you normalize, we normalize the activity of uh, plasma adam that are from different species, uh, uh, for example, rat, sheep, a mouse and human, and humanize using the uh, human 71, we found that some of these animals, which are of great interest in our research, they cleaved human 71 very poorly. But when we tried this cattle 71, we found that they did better with the cattle 71 of a human. So we can standardize the human, and we can measure human samples and also animal models samples quite with the one-one substrate, that's cattle 71, instead of using the two substrates. But for the CARTO-71 has not been validated by samples from the TTP patients, because the most important is not the substrate. The most important, especially for validation, is to know that the, sam the substrate can work with the, what? With the samples. So to do that, we have, uh, over the summer, we wanted to validate CARTO-71 using the clinically relevant samples. First and foremost, I need to inform that the CARTO-71, uh, as it takes only 20 minutes to complete because it's much more sensitive than, than human 71. And we also use, use, you, we also use ebonalyzed and serum samples, while like the uh, private, sam, uh, private method, FRED73, uses a citrate. But I need to bring back because uh, ebonalyzed samples and serums are the most ideal because they don't have a compound that chelate uh, metal ions such as calcium, which interfere with the, the, the atom tetrahedral inactivity. So to validate uh, CARTO-71, what we have done is that we have taken 100 samples, uh, which we have biobanked we, 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 we bio in our laboratory. And these samples, these, these are in Dano, so we know their values. And we compared both the human 71 that I made uh, several years ago and the CARTO-71. And if you look at this uh, line, it's almost like, almost the swap should be one, if the two assays agree. Uh, but we still, this is, we're still asking more samples, but I want to um, explore and show that we are more interested in those samples with the less than 10%. So when we compare human 71 uh, y-axis and the cardo 71, we see that this line, the slope, tilts towards the x-y-axis. That means that the, the cardo 71, the cardo 71 is better at detecting the residual atom tears that inactivity. And from a uh, clinical perspective, when we talk about the residual Adam TS-13, it's the activity between zero and 5%. And that's very important, especially for the patients, because research have shown that those patients with the residual Adam TS-13, uh, they take longer to relapse than those who do not have uh, residual Adam TS-13. So it's very important to monitor Adam TS-13, even the patient who has less than 5%. So using CARTO-71 would be better than human 71 to monitor residual Adam TS-13 in the patients. And also part of validation, we, have, we also have to do the external validation. External validation, you have to use another reference laboratory and in Dano. So we have gone and partnered with the Oklahoma TTP registry uh, uh, at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And they have sent us about 120 samples of serum 
um, uh, samples. This is a blinded study, and they have used FRED 73 on the, on the Y axis, and then we have the CARO 71. And so far, the data, so far we have uh, has it 80 samples, and the we can see is that uh, um, we have found that the Adam TS13 activity acid by the first 73, which is the most popular in the field, has limited, like, has limited sensitivity because, see, if you look at the limit of dissection, um, this as cannot detect less than 5%, but they also don't measure more than 100% because, I mean, it's normal. But if you looked at the cut of 71, you can go all the way from zero uh, to above the maximum, which is uh, between 150 and 200. So the, uh, this validation is still in progress because we still have more samples to assay, and then also the analysis, we need to take care of those samples that are less than 5% that were not detected by the FRED 73. So with that, uh, uh, I would like to thank the uh, people who have been working on my laboratory since I came to uh, OSUCHS. I have two talented medical students, uh, Cooper Anson and Cameron Barton and technician in my laboratory, Ferenda Miranda. We also want to thank you, the Oklahoma TTB registry, um, uh, read by Dr. Uh, Professor James George and the group. And then uh, I want to thank the funding agencies and also institutions that have supported my research. And also I want to thank you for listening to me. And uh, I'm happy to, uh, to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Moya. <laughs> questions for Dr. Moya before we uh, take a break? Very good, thank you. Dr. Biggs, so we have a break, is that correct? Yes, sir, we're going to. Thank you. Thank you. Apologize. Thank you so much. For that, um, we, yes, we are going to have a 10 minute break at this time. At this point, we need all our poster pre presenters to meet in the East Lobby. Again, all poster presenters need to meet in the East Lobby for interaction with the judges. Additionally, I want to remind everyone that we will have our award ceremony at the conclusion of today's presentation in the West Lobby. You need to check those name tags for drink tickets. And if for some reason you didn't get drink tickets, uh, you can visit with, with those at the registration table to get that resolved. Uh, we did also want to give an update on parking. There were a handful of vehicles that received a citation even though they had a parking pass in their window. So if that is the case for you, uh, if you will send us an image of your citation to interact at okstate.edu, we will work to help you get that resolved. So with that, we will see you back in 10 minutes and we will conclude with our fourth and final session for the day.
learning things yeah, while I'm in the right. hospital. Dr. Rocha, he was very capable. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, is that presentation mode okay there for you, or would you rather have what will be on the screen duplicated? It can look like this, or it can look like... This one is okay. This okay? Okay. So, this will move it forward. This will move it back. Mm -hmm. And if you would like the pointer, I'm going to leave it down here in the left-hand okay. corner. Just kind of keep an eye on that if you use it. I, I like to drag it back down there to the corner. Otherwise, if you like, da da da, and then it's like there's a random red dot in your all your slides. And if you don't care to use it, you can just click over here. Um, don't start until Dr. Lacombe introduces you and your title, which will be very brief. And then on questions, if we have any questions from the audience, if you'll repeat that question. Mm -hmm. Okay. It helps the virtual audience stay kind of in, in step with what's going on here. Okay. Anything else I can do for you? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to step out to the restroom. I will be back and um, we'll get started, I don't know, seven or eight minutes from now. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you.
Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah, because I want to look at the time. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm. We are going to go ahead and get started with our fourth and final session of the Interact Symposium for the day. Uh, I'm joined on stage by Dr. Veronique Lacombe from the College of Veterinary Medicine. I will assist in moderating this final session and I will turn it over to Dr. Lacombe. Good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to start our fourth and last session, and I'm sure we're going to have some exciting talk that we had since the beginning of this Interact Research Symposium. So our first speaker is Dr. Dang, is an assistant professor in the Department of Physiological Sciences at Oklahoma State College of Veterinary Medicine, and the title of his talk is Coronavirus Endoribonuclease Mediate Evasion of Host Cell antiviral defenses. Dr. Dang. Thank you for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us. Um, yeah, like uh, uh, Dr. Linkov said, um, uh, during this uh, pandemic, I heard a lot of people, even our news media, talk about uh, interchangeably use the, the terms of uh, uh, coronaviruses and COVID-19, and they think COVID-19 is the coronaviruses. Coronavirus is the COVID-19. As my colleague, uh, Dr. Rujo Chanapanava uh, talked about earlier, and there are many coronaviruses. And, and so far, there has been uh, seven um, human coronaviruses been found that um, cause like SARS, MERS, and common cold. Coronaviruses also infect um, various animals, uh, including our, um, and cows, pigs, chickens, as well as uh, our pets, and laboratory um, mice. And coronavirus also exists in the nature. And the bat, and I think that's the major reservoir for the zoonotic coronaviruses. And, that, and the SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 are very likely came from um, bat coronaviruses. And based on their genetic similarity, there are four genera for, uh, of coronavirus, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Remember, this delta is not a delta variant. They can infect different organs, they can cause pneumonia and diarrhea. And my lab is interested in um, understanding how coronavirus replicate inside the cells and cause disease. And but, and my, our goal is to identify viral target that for uh, an antiviral drug de development and a vaccine development. So um, toward this goal, we want to understand, investigate how coronavirus interact, interact with the host cells, particularly how the virus um, and antagonize the host antiviral, innate antiviral immunity. So I have a super simple uh, cartoon illustrate this offense and defense process. So simply the virus um, binds the cells, releases its genome to inside the cells. Then the cell, the, the, the positive sense of RNA genome can transcribe to make a negative sense of RNA. And those negative sense of RNA will be uh, transcribed to produce more positive sense of RNAs. In general, those are molecules that will be easily detected by host uh, sensors and amount of robust host antiviral responses. Well, as a successful organism in the Darwin uh, evolution theory, those viruses must evolve a very um, variety of uh, uh, tactics to uh, in counteract these uh, anti uh, host antiviral responses. Um, the central question is here, which, what were the viral protein um, it counteract the host antiviral system? And today I'm gonna tell you one of those protein and that 
can inhibit host uh, and antiviral responses. This protein is called an um, SP15. SP15 is a non-structural protein encoded by this virus here. And this protein has a viral endoribonucleus activity. It can cleave uh, and the uridine nucleotides of the RNAs and is highly conserved among, uh, highly conserved. All the coronavirus has this enzyme. Um, initially, we thought this enzyme must be important for viral replication for the viral RNA synthesis. Um, but interestingly, we found it's not. And initially, I made a um, couple of uh, mutant virus that express um, the endo-U doesn't have this endo-U activity and using reverse genetic system. So basically, this virus, uh, this graph showed the replication kinetics of the virus, uh, the mutant virus um, colored in red. And as you can see, those and the endo-U mutant virus replicate as well as the wild-type virus. And, but interestingly, when the wild-type um, macrophages infect those uh, the mutant virus, the replication of the mutant virus significantly impaired in those cells. And this data together and indicate this loss of uh, endo-U activity associated with the uh, impair of uh, uh, the viral replication, and suggest the NSP15, this endo-U activity can prevent the host interferon response. So to test that, um, I took the macrophages, infect the, the mutant virus, and look at the um, interferon alpha uh, RNA level. As you can see, uh, at various time points, you can see this the mutant virus in fact cells has much, induce much more interferon alpha as labeled in, in the red. And this only uh, qPCR data also uh, confirmed with the ELISA data which showed the uh, interferon R protein level much higher in the mutant virus in fact macrophages. And we further found out this, this interferon response is MD5 molecule dependent. So when the MD5 knockout macrophage infect this virus, it doesn't produce interferon. So this data suggests the endo U uh, activity, a mediated interferon response through the MD5. MD5 is a double strand RNA um, sensor. And so we question this, what's the mechanism? How does endo U um, if, uh, antagonize the interferon response? So we came up with this model. So uh, the virus, the positive sense of a genome, uh, has a very long uh, poly A tail, and is transcribed by the viral um, RNA-dependent RNA, RNA polymerase to produce a negative sense of RNA with the virulence of the uh, poly U sequence at the five prime end. So with, we hypothesize this endo U must cleave this poly U sequence off the, uh, the in genomic RNA. And otherwise, those, um, those RNAs, negative RNA, with the long poly U uh, has will form this DS uh, double strand RNA like molecule, which can in activate the host sensors. So the existence of those negative sense RNA with the poly U sequence poly U uh, sequences has been confirmed um, in the 1990s. Though we want to test, does this NDU able to cleave the poly U sequence off the necrosense RNA? So to do that, we synthesize the two RNA oligos, and RNA three and four. Both RNA oligos have exact same in, in sequence, except the RNA three has a poly U uh, sequence on the five, five prime end. So as you can see, in the presence of the NDU and the manganese, and the NDU able to cleave the poly U sequence to produce a 48 uh, nucleotide product, which is the same size as the RNA, the RNA oligo 4. So this is an in vitro and uh, synthetic RNA. We also test um, the viral RNA. So we in vitro transcribe the five prime, the five UTR of the next strand of RNA, and then incubate with the endo U, purified endo U uh, enzyme, 
and we can see in the presence of the um, enzyme and the manganese and the RNA being um, processed and yield a smaller band compared to the, uh, the product without the enzyme. So still this is in a biochemical assay. We want to test if this happened during the viral infection. We uh, took the, uh, the RNA that extract from the cells infected with the mutant virus and did a PCA approach to look at the uh, five prime end of the necrosense RNA. So as you can see, in contrast to the, the wild type infected cells, in the mutant virus infected cell, we can detect the product have a multiple, uh, a very length of a bands. And we sequence those bands and indicate those, those do those larger band, do you have a longer polyu sequence? So this data indicate that the NDU do, does cleave off the polyu sequence from the negative sense RNA. So the next question is, does those polyu containing sequence can activate the host uh, sensors? So we, we transfract those uh, RNAs into the cells. As you can see, those RNAs are very potent interferon inducer and in the, in the case that we treat those RNA with the NDU, the interferon response has significantly diminished. So this data together indicating that NDU could cleave off the polyo sequence and prevent interferon activation. So everything that I told you is in the cell culture. We, next, we want to know what happened if the mutant virus infect mice. So basically, we took uh, we use a mouse infected the mutant virus, and the wild type virus replicated very well at D3, D5. We can we saw a very high titer, but in the mutant virus uh, infected mouse, we cannot detect infectious virus in both the uh, livers and the spleens, and the the mice uh, the the mice infected the mutant virus. 100% survive from infection in comparison to the wild type, uh, which has been killed in, in, within the 10 days. Um, similar to what we saw in the macrophages, when we infect the interferon receptor knockout mice, the mice succumb to the infection. The mutant virus kill the mice just as well as the wild type virus. Here's a, the HE staining of the mouse liver. As you can see, the, the wild type infection can cause a very typical uh, liver lesion in, in this section. But the, the mutant virus infect mice, they are the, the liver very healthy. So those data together indicate that NDU do is a very um, major virulence factor for the coronavirus and the likely due to the interferon antagonism. So I hope what I tell you, you can get it is the uh, three points today is uh, the coronavirus is a large virus family can infect multiple uh, different species. Also, the virus have a variety of uh, uh, tactics to counteract the host innate immunity. And the NDU is one of them, can cleave the poly U sequence of the next strain RNA and prevent the interferon production. So uh, next, I want to spend two slides to tell you now what I'm we are doing right now. I joined the, uh, the College of Veterinary Medicine two months ago. I started a project to look into the, the SARS-CoV-2 adaptation. So since the first being found in the humans, the virus being, has acquired a tons of mutation cross genome. As illustrated by this graph, which is I analyzed the over 3,000 genomes of uh, SARS-CoV-2 isolates that represent all the lineage of the virus. You can see the mutation is occurred across the entire genome. And, but the, however, the majority of those mutations are neutral and random, not uh, consistent. So I will now show you this uh, Shannon entropy plot, which is considered the, the randomness and uncertainty. Uh, majority of those mutations uh, eliminate, I mean, it's, it's gone and only a few of the region are stand out. And like you, earlier you saw my colleague and Dr. Uh, Roger Tranapalamash talk about the, why some of the strain have much ability to inhibit the host antiviral response. And 
I found probably those mutations might uh, come from those ability for to the virus. So my goal is to identify what mutation and to confer this virus must adapt to the human population, replicate so fast, and also try to understand the underlying mechanism. So another project in my lab is to um, study the animal coronaviruses. As I told you earlier, that many coronaviruses also infect animals, cause a very severe disease. As part of the this one health principles, I want to analyze the, the knowledge we learn from the uh, human coronavirus to save our animals. I also want to apply the knowledge we learn from the animal models of the coronavirus to benefit um, the, uh, we study in the human coronaviruses. We particularly focus on those uh, tissue-specific pathogenesis as well as uh, um, develop good vaccine as our collaborator at the USDA. So last, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, yeah, we are a new lab, and we are welcome uh, students and uh, collaborations. I'm happy to take any question you may have. Thank you, Dr. Deng. For the sake of time, we're going to have to go to the next presenter, but there is uh, obviously the ceremony uh, after this session, so hopefully people will have a chance to ask you a question. Thank you again for a great talk. All right. The next presenter is Dr. Sunil Moore. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Pathobiology at the College of Veterinary Medicine at OSU, and this talk is going to be on tularemia. Thank you, Dr. Lacombe. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. In fact, good evening. I'm a little bit freezing here, so give me a moment to warm up. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, tularemia. Uh, and uh, my lab doesn't work on tularemia, OK? I don't work on this pathogen. But I'm a pathologist. And being a pathologist gives me an opportunity to work on these different animal pathogens you know, uh, that infect different type of animals and that have potential to infect human, uh, human beings. So uh, uh, in the month of September, we diagnosed a couple of cases of tularemia. Uh, one was in cat and one was in, uh, in a foal. Okay? Uh, the cat one didn't surprise us, but the foal did surprise us. Uh, we don't really expect uh, horses uh, getting tularemia. So I wonder, you know, uh, what's going on? Uh, you know, uh, usually human outbreaks of tularemia are preceded by the animal outbreaks. So I, I was curious uh, to see uh, what, 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 what is the picture of uh, uh, tularemia in Oklahoma in terms of animal cases as, cases, as well as human cases. So tularemia is caused by uh, Francisilla tularensis. Uh, it's known by different names. It's also uh, the more common name uh, used by people is rabbit fever. Uh, there are, uh, this is a gram-negative intracellular organism uh, that replicates uh, efficiently in uh, macrophages. Uh, there are four subspecies of uh, uh, Francisilla. Uh, Francisilla uh, tularensis, uh, subspecies tularensis, is prevalent in North America and is responsible for most of the outbreaks. Okay. Uh, Holartica is, uh, is uh, most commonly found in the uh, northern hemisphere. Uh, it's also considered pathogenic. Other two species, subspecies of uh, tularemia has unknown pathogenicity uh, 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 for human as well as animal species. And um, uh, I think they, they, they can be worked in BSL2 facility, whereas the type, one, type A and type B requires, uh, they are select agent and they require BSL3 facility. Uh, Tularemia, uh, tularemia can happen in more than 100 species of animals. Uh, most commonly infected animals are rabbits, uh, hares, rodents, and cats. Uh, Francisella is transmitted by uh, uh, these arthropods, uh, ticks, flies, mosquitoes. Uh, they carry these uh, uh, bacteria in the, uh, in the bloodstream, and uh, when the, they bite, uh, uh, they're going to deposit the, uh, the bacteria um, in the lacerated skin, uh, skin wounds. The tularemia uh, can also be uh, inhaled, okay? Uh, so that if there is a uh, contaminated tissue, uh, urine, or feces, uh, that can be inhaled uh, through droplets or dust and cause a pulmonary form of uh, pneumonia. As well as uh, uh, this bacterium can be deposited into uh, 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 skin or mucous membranes via direct contact. Uh, typical clinical signs of tularemia are uh, uh, involve 
depending on the root of the infection, okay? Uh, there can be an ulcero glandular form or there can be a, a typhoidal form. So typical uh, symptoms are uh, flu-like symptoms. You get acute uh, fever, chills, uh, uh, lymph nodes are swollen. Mortality rate with uh, tularemia is quite high, uh, up to 60%. Uh, but if you get uh, um, prophylactic uh, um, antibiotic treatment, the mortality is significantly reduced. Now, tularemia is a reportable disease. Uh, it's a zoonotic disease. Uh, uh, animals can give it to human, uh, human beings. Uh, this bacteria is very infectious. Uh, only 10 organisms uh, can cause a lethal disease. And uh, uh, Francisella can survive in harsh conditions for weeks. Uh, uh, so uh, because of its uh, ability, to, ability to survive in harsh conditions and uh, ease, uh, ease of becoming aerosolized, this can, be, uh, this can be used as a bioterrorism weapon, and that's why this is a reportable disease. So whenever we diagnose a case, uh, we are required to report it to the health officials uh, for proper tracking uh, of the contacts uh, of the involved people. So to, stu uh, to study what, what cases we, uh, we had uh, diagnosed in uh, our laboratory, we looked at the uh, archived case material where we diagnosed the uh, different cases based on gross lesions, uh, PCR, serology, or immunohistochemistry. Uh, necropsies uh, were performed with biosafety protocols. Uh, we, uh, if it's a small animal, if it's a cat or a rabbit, we directly put them on, in the biosafety hood. But um, I, I should let you guys know that um, Odal is uh, equipped with a BSL-3 facility where you can uh, do large animals such as horses. Okay? Uh, the human cases uh, data uh, was obtained from CDC website. So from 2014 to 2021, we diagnosed uh, 20 cases uh, of tularemia in animals. Uh, uh, as expected, cats were, uh, cats were uh, majority of the cases were cats, followed by uh, rabbits, and um, then there was one case in dog and one was in the, in the horse that I mentioned. If you, look, if you look at the graph on the right side, uh, every year we are diagnosing about uh, you know, two to four cases uh, of tularemia in our, in our lab. But if you look at carefully on the y-axis, uh, year 2020 is missing. And I don't know how many weird things we are going to find about 2020, but that year we didn't diagnose any cases of tularemia. Not that we were closed during that time. In fact, I should mention that uh, we actually overworked during that year. Uh, it's off topic, but we were uh, we were first few we were the first few labs veterinary labs that were diagnosing human uh, COVID cases, and I think uh, that's a true One Health approach uh, that we took during the pandemic. So coming back to these cases, uh, animal cases are uh, usually uh, they experience sudden deaths. So within one to day one to two days, uh, the animals will die. Most of the animals that that acquire tularemia. Uh, they are wild, wild animals or indoor outdoor animals. So sometimes um, if they're dead outside, uh, people may not notice and we may not get the animals for diagnosis. So there, might, there may, might have been cases in 2020, but uh, uh, just didn't reach us. So when we, uh, we wanted to see what's the distribution of uh, these cases in uh, Oklahoma counties. So this is the map of Oklahoma. Um, we have 77 counties, and uh, the counties that are highlighted in paleo -low color uh, did not report any cases, or we did not diagnose any cases in those counties. Uh, the counties that are highlighted in white uh, is where our cases are coming from, and uh, highest number of cases were found in Payne County, where we are uh, currently standing, uh, followed by the uh, Grady County. It appears that uh, mostly the cases are uh, um, centered around a mess most of the cases are uh, scattered in central Oklahoma. Um, then I further uh, looked into, you know, uh, what kind of tick populations uh, is scattered in these counties. So our, our National Center for Veterinary Parasitology has done some amazing work, and I could uh, uh, find their studies that uh, these amblyoma and dermacenter ticks were prevalent in many Oklahoma counties. So um, we're not surprised that there were uh, uh, that many cases uh, uh, in Oklahoma. So uh, let's talk about a couple of cases that we, uh, we di recently diagnosed uh, in uh, diag our diagnostic lab. So this was the, f uh, the, the foal was presented to, presented to our teaching hospital suspected for pneumonia. Uh, it, it was running high fever, and uh, 
Owner also reported that uh, they pulled out some ticks from this, uh, this foal. Another patient uh, was cat. Uh, this cat uh, went to the RDVM for not doing well. RDVM gave, him, uh, gave the cat um, some injections, and I think the cat died uh, suddenly after the in, uh, injections. And the owners were really upset that cat died because of, in, uh, uh, because of infection, uh, sorry, because of injections, so they were curious to know what, what went on. So this is, a, this, is the, this is the horse, okay? If you're not familiar with uh, horse anatomy, this is the abdominal cavity, this is the thoracic cavity, okay? This is the lung, this is the liver, this is the spleen. And there should be a diaphragm in between, but since it's cut open, the diaphragm is uh, not visible. But uh, the lungs uh, should be um, pale pink, okay? But these lungs have these um, multiple, numerous pale white foci, slightly raised foci. And these are the areas of necrosis uh, because of tularemia in this horse. Similar lesions can be seen in the, in the, in the liver as well as spleen. Let's take a closer look at the, uh, look at the spleen. Uh, here are these white foci I'm talking about. Then these are the cross sections, cut sections of the lung and the liver. And you can see there are numerous necrotic foci in, in these uh, two organs. Looking at, uh, looking at the histology of, uh, of the spleen, uh, this, this is the cat that I talked about. Um, when I opened the cat, I saw those numerous foci in the, uh, in the spleen. So I took, I took out the uh, pieces of spleen and sent it for PCR. And I uh, bagged the cat back because uh, I was pretty sure that this is going to be the diagnosis. And sure enough, it came back as tularema positive. And then when we looked at the spleen, so the spleen uh, normally contains these red pulp areas and then the white pulp areas, and these are the trabeculae. But here are the areas of necrosis. Those are pale white uh, 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 areas uh, in the spleen. These, uh, um, the splenic parenchyma is replaced by this uh, cataractic debris here. Uh, these contain a lot of uh, degenerate neutrophils as well as um, um, uh, different inflammatory cells. Looking at the liver from, the, uh, from that uh, horse, uh, from the foal, uh, this is the, these are the normal hepatocytes uh, in these areas. And you can see in the center, this is the large area uh, that is, uh, of the hepatocytes that is replaced by uh, uh, neutrophils, inflammation, and necrotic debris, okay? In the inset here, uh, wh what I'm showing here uh, is uh, immunohistochemistry for uh, Francisella, and you can see the antigen is um, uh, detected in the macrophages. Then we wanted to look at the um, distribution of uh, um, Tularemia in different U.S. states, uh, and I wanted to look at Oklahoma, where we are standing. And surprisingly, uh, actually not surprisingly, we were uh, number three in the United States. So these neighboring states, uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Missouri, uh, they are the top four states uh, where human cases of tularemia are detected. And we, uh, we have uh, accumulated uh, between 2010 and 19 almost uh, 226 uh, tularemia cases. These cases uh, are on the rise during the uh, months uh, between March and during, uh, up to September, okay? And that's where the tick population uh, is, on the, is on the rise as well. Uh, furthermore, what I'm gonna look at is, uh, I'm gonna look at the data of the uh, human cases, and we can see that since 2010 up to 2018, we are, um, uh, seeing the increased trend of tularemia cases. Uh, no, what I'm curious now is uh, if these cases corresponds to animal cases in terms of uh, which county they are coming from. So we're trying to get the data from the health officials uh, if, we can, uh, we, if we can locate these cases uh, in terms of counties. So to conclude my talk, uh, zoonot uh, tularemia is a zoonotic disease, uh, and Oklahoma incidence is pretty high. Um, this, uh, due to this uh, case uh, diagnosed in, in the foal, um, we should expect uh, tularemia in unexpected host as well, because, uh, our, uh, the, because of the tick population here in Oklahoma. So animal handlers and veterinarians should, be, uh, should consider tularemia as a differential uh, when they see some um, 
symptoms such, uh, such as fever and um, uh, sudden death in uh, the animals that are indoor and outdoor. Okay. Again, uh, tularemia is a reportable disease. So uh, whenever we diagnose a case, we, uh, we report it to health authorities. Um, and uh, if you are a veterinarian handling those cases, uh, you, should, you, should, you are responsible to report that case. With this, uh, I would like to thank you. Um, uh, thank you to the um, Diagnostic Lab here uh, pro for providing the support for uh, performing additional testing. And I would like to take any questions if you have. Thank you, Dr. Mo. Again, because of time, we're going to move on to the next speaker. And hopefully, you'll have the opportunity to talk to the presenter during the closing ceremony if you have any additional question. Uh, next uh, presenter is uh, a student from Oklahoma State University Center for Health. Uh, and uh, it's Alexandro Torres, and he's going to talk to us about the impact of social stress in adolescent oxycodone dependence and withdrawal. Welcome, Alexandro. The stage is yours. Hello, everyone. First, I want to thank you all for staying here and tuning in. I'm very excited, and this is a, an honor to be here today with you, to be able to present my research in the short period that I have been part of the program uh, at OSU CHS. And uh, also, first, I want to acknowledge my mentor, Dr. Vasquez, for this opportunity, um, for guiding us through this, to also Dr. Kuhler, who has, well, has been forming part of this new research that I'm doing our team on animal care facilities, and of course the funding agencies that have made this possible. And my research today uh, involves uh, the, uh, studying the, the effects of opioids on adolescents, and also we are interested to understand what it's doing to the gut microbiome. Why is this relevant? Well, in the United States, 9.5% uh, of high school students develop uh, chronic oxycodone use, which has led to the development of dependence. Well, during adolescence, there's uh, still a, a great amount of neuroplasticity happening, and experiences can shape uh, the behavior. The opioid cycle begins by the uses of, of this drug, which can develop into a dependence and addiction and ultimately, when the drug is, is uh, were attempted to be stopped, the emotional and physical negative effects can uh, occur, this causing a, a relapse. These effects are uh, the withdrawal effects. And also, uh, the adolescent gut microbiome is affected by the use of opioids. One of the most common effects uh, are uh, constipation. Well, in adults, uh, it is suggested that the microbiome got at brain access contribute to many changes that are cognitive and overall uh, in the mental health, and they might be influencing the intestinal dysbiosis. So we know that the uh, gut-brain axis now is a uh, two-way uh, bi-directional communication between the brain and the gut microbiome, and they all can influence the immune system and all of these uh, can also uh, affect the behavior, the cognitive function, the mental health, the pain, and uh, neurogenesis. Uh, stress is a common thing. We cannot really avoid it. It's necessary when we need to do something such as public speaking. We gotta get ready for a run, but a lot of it in an early stage, it can be very detrimental for the development of the brain. Especially uh, early life stress, adversity, or uh, adverse childhood experiences, is something we're interested to look at. Uh, we are interested in finding a model that can represent the neglection and household dysfunction. And our translational model of ACES is uh, a consistence of using uh, sprogidale male and female rats that we are going to expose to uh, an environment in different conditions. In this case, we are trying to mimic the neglect or uh, the all household dysfunction uh, conditions. So we had a model that we call our isolated environment condition. And this one, they are being socially neglected. There's not a lot of motor or any sensory stimulation happening on this condition. 
And on contrast to that, we have our enriched condition environment. These animals have been paired with more than two peers. They are constantly being handled. They have motor and sensory and social stimulation. And of course, we're out of control group. As I mentioned, um, the development of the brain uh, continues after uh, adolescence, so it is very uh, detrimental to, to properly guide the, the environment of, of, of a, a child and, and to adolescence and to transition to adulthood because uh, neuroplasticity is, uh, is still going. And we believe that uh, changes and stress on, during these periods are going to affect the brain and the gut microbiome. One of the uh, things that I mentioned that I'm interested in looking at is what are the effects of social stress and adverse childhood experiences and the use of oxycodone. So we will uh, want to analyze and see what is affected in the uh, gut-brain uh, microbiome axis. And as I mentioned earlier, this can uh, alter the behavior and it can uh, also uh, interfere with the immune system, and all of this uh, is a cycle of communication that, that can affect the development of, of the brain. One of the molecules that I'm interested in looking at is brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is a very important molecule for the development of, uh, of uh, news, uh, neural signaling, and uh, we can find that in two forms. There is a pro and the mature version of BDNF, and uh, they all act on different uh, receptors inducing different uh, effects as well. And uh, we know that pro-BDNF acts as a uh, um, neuromodulator that can uh, uh, induce apoptosis, neuroinflammation, or atrophy. And it is uh, very pronounced uh, when in cases of stress, alcohol, heroin usage. But mature BDNF can be boosted by physical exercise, social interaction, uh, healthy diet, and it promotes neural survival, efficient uh, pruning, and synaptic plasticity. Also, we know that BDNF is found on the gut, and it also modulates uh, the release of the, uh, and the movement of the entire nervous system, which will uh, affect the uh, gastric motility. So our specific aims for my investigation is to analyze the effects of oxycodone dependence and the differential reading conditions on adolescent gut microbiota. And secondly, to determine the effects of oxycodone dependence and precipitated withdrawal in pro and mature BDNF on the prefrontal cortex of adolescent rats. So I, the mechanism of, of what we're looking at is how social stress can impact the microbiome dysbiosis and how the, the BDNF that is uh, in the uh, gut can also influence the effects of oxycodone in the adolescent. So for our methods, as I mentioned earlier, we are using these different reading environments, which are our enriched environment, our isolated environment, and our standard condition. We are going to expose our, uh, our rats uh, during a period of 30 days, which is equivalent to their infancy stage and adolescence. And then on the day 52, we're gonna begin a, a dose of oxycodone treatment, which is going to be given two times a, a day in increasing dose manner. Also, on the sixth day, we're going to give them an injection of naloxone, which is an opioid and anta uh, receptor antagonist. What it will do is to precipitate the effect of dependence or withdrawal also, at uh, the beginning of the, uh, the treatment, two days prior, we begin collecting fecal samples that we will analyze for the gut microbiome. The effects of uh, naloxone uh, after uh, the injection were recorded 20 minutes after, and uh, we were looking for uh, in stress or anxiety-like behaviors which can uh, be seen on the animals as rearing, walking, and sniffing behaviors. And uh, also the, the fecal samples were used for uh, microbial and DNA uh, isolation uh, of, of the DNA of these pellets. And also we had a colon, uh, uh, my, uh, my, uh, we had some fecal samples that were from the colon. And these were uh, analyzed using a 16 as uh, ribosomal RNA gene uh, amplicon sequencing, 
which then we were looking at composition, the abundance and diversity of the uh, microbiome. Also from the brains uh, of, that I extracted from these animals, we uh, looked at the medial prefrontal cortex and then we got uh, punches from them where I, I used those, I homogenized those uh, tissues uh, to look for the presence of mature and pro BDNF using an ELISA kit. We do know that an increase of stress will also show us increase of withdrawal signs. And in this graph, we have represented the effects of, of frequency of the sniffing was one of the effects of uh, the withdrawal symptoms that we will be seeing. And we have two groups on the bottom of, of this uh, uh, graph. All of those conditions are also represented here. We have our enriched uh, condition, isolated condition, standard condition. Uh, for both groups. However, the first group of the intoxication one, they received the oxycodone only, and the dependence group had received the naloxone. So the effects that we can see is that they, uh, they actually had a, a major number of effects on the isolated uh, environment condition in comparison to the enriched condition on for the dependence group. Also, another behavior that we looked at was the frequency of rare walking which, on, again, we saw that there's an actual increase of this effect on the uh, isolated environment condition when we compare to all of the other um, groups, and uh, in ex especially to the enriched environment condition was significantly lower. So we now understand the isolated environment increases the naloxone-induced stereotype behavior, while the enriched environment protects against oxycodone withdrawal. Next, uh, we analyzed the, the uh, bacterial uh, samples from those colon, uh, for those uh, fecal microbiota and from the colon microbiota. And this is just one example of them. And this uh, organism, Butyricococcus, um, uh, showed that the relative abundance after uh, being administered in uh, oxycodone to the animal, the relative abundance of this organism have decreased. Uh, here, as you can see, this is the baseline before we give the treatment, and as the treatment progresses and the oxycodone uh, intake increases, the, the organism uh, are relative abundance has also decreased. So we know that butyrate producing bacteria are a beneficial or maybe like a probiotic bacteria, so oxycodone is in fact uh, affecting this organism. Next, we have another uh, uh, relative abundance of um, check, but this is for uh, the different environmental conditions, which over here on the bottom you can see enriched environment, isolated environment, and uh, standard environments for oxycodone treated uh, animals and the saline treated ones. And we have seen uh, that the actual oxycodone is, is, is doing an effect on the, on the number of these uh, cholidextribacter. One more organism that we uh, looked at was the rhombostia, which is in, in the effects of a uh, sex-dependent effect. So we got our females on the red color bars, and then we have our males on the, on the green color bars. And we, uh, at the same time, we had an oxycodone group uh, comparing with the saline uh, group. And what we can see is that uh, oxycodone is increasing the number of these bacteria in there. And uh, we know that uh, these rhombostia, uh, literature says that uh, it, it seems to increase the preference for oxycodone, so we know that those are the hedonic suppleasant effects. Lastly, we look at the levels of uh, BDNF on the brain and the medial prefrontal cortex, and for our uh, surprise, Pro BDNF levels seem to be v largely pronounced on the isolated environment condition in comparison to the saline treated group of the same. And uh, when we compare them to the other groups, uh, it has the largest significance uh, compared to the enriched environment or saline environment that also receive oxycodone. And for the mature BDNF levels, a similar trend was uh, seen since there was no effect from the enriched environment, but the isolated environment had as a certain uh, increase on the 
on the levels of mature BDNF. So we now uh, depict the isolated em environment induced a twofold increase in pro and mature BDNF in comparison to the enriched en environment. So uh, we know that an isolated environment can actually cause a, a, a dis uh, breaking the, the balance of pro and mature BDNF. And perhaps uh, an enriched condition can diminish the effects and the negative withdrawal effects of oxycodone treatment. And uh, this is so far the, the uh, research that I've worked with, and I'm excited to continue it. But uh, right now, I want to thank you for your time, and I'm open for any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. We have time for one quick question from the audience. No? Okay, great. Well, thank you again for a great job. Thank you. All right. So, uh, next uh, presenter is Said Narayanan. I'm sorry, I didn't pronounce this right. <laughs> From uh, the uh, College of Veterinary Medicine, the Department of Pathobiology, and is going to talk to us today about hyperplex computation protocol for metagenome-based infectious disease diagnosis. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Lacombe, and thank you to everyone who gave me this opportunity. I'm here to talk about hyperplex computational protocols for metagenome-based infectious disease diagnosis. So my talk will include an introduction where I talk about common laboratory techniques we use currently, metagenomics in general, and the sequencing technologies we used, followed by initial studies we perform. And then I'll start with computational protocol algorithm development, results, and conclusions. So for any existing, new, or emerging disease, we need a diagnostic tool. And some of the common tools we use in any diagnostic laboratory is visual examination, such as histopathology, culture-based techniques, such as bacterial and viral culture, molecular tests, such as PCR, and serological techniques, such as ELISA. All these techniques are extremely reliable. We still use them, but they have few challenges that have to be addressed in the future. One of those is multiplexing, or detecting multiple pathogens simultaneously, which is currently restrained in any diagnostic laboratory. And the next thing is time constraints. And when it comes to bacterial and viral cultures, we need to spend two days to 30 days to get a possible result. So we need a diagnostic tool that's faster, that's accurate, and can detect unlimited number of pathogens. And that is why we explored metagenome sequencing. To define metagenome, it's all the genetic material present in an environment, or in our case, a clinical sample. So in any clinical sample, 95 to 99 percentage of genetic material is from the host. The rest, 1 to 5 percentage is from pathogens, common cells, and environmental sources. Metagenome sequencing is the process of sequencing all this genetic material without any bias. In theory, it is a single sample for analysis of all pathogens of interest. So to test this theory, we need sequencers. And the sequencers currently available at OADDL, our laboratory, are Minion, Gridion, and Illumina IC100. We use Minion and Gridion because these are portable long-reach sequencers, which have been reported to be used in the International Space Station, in the Arctic, and the tropics. So we chose a known negative bovine lung, which was negative for bovine respiratory disease pathogens. BRD is caused by six different bacteria and five different viruses. It's a multi-etiology disease. We confirmed that this negative lung was, we confirmed it to be negative using PCR and culture-based techniques. We sequenced the lung for four hours, generated 489 megabases of data. The output from a sequence is usually random DNA sequences with no idea about the DNA origin. So we need bioinformatics tools to classify the DNA. And we use Kraken2, and we found a huge number of pathogens in there. One of the significant findings we found were Pashual ACA and Essene ACA. I'm sorry it's not clearly visible, but Pashual ACA is one of the major family responsible for bovine respiratory disease, which we tested to be negative in our PCR and culture. And Essene ACA in particular, I got Essenia pestis right there. The abundance of these pathogens was approximately 0.04% of the total metagenome. It might be insignificant, but still, the diagnostic reliability of such a technique is questionable. So we need an accurate diagnostic tool, and that is why we explored machine learning algorithms. 
Machine learning might sound advanced, but everyone here probably has access to Siri or Google Assistant or face and lock or fingerprint sensor, which are some of the common pattern recognition based machine learning algorithms. With our help, our collaborators in the Department of Computer Science developed one such pattern recognition algorithm. And this algorithm follows three major steps, where we take the entire metagenome data and represent it as vectors in an n-dimensional space. And then we take each and every single DNA sequence, represent it as images. Now we converge these vectors and images to provide patterns that are specific to our pathogens of interest. So the first step is global representation, where the entire metagenome data is converted into a vector representation. We break the metagenome into k-mers. K-mers are a subsequence of a read, and we start with three bases to five bases. In any DNA sequence, the first three bases will be considered as a k-mer, and then we'll skip a considerable amount of bases, just in this case, and then we take choose the next k-mer. Now, these bases that are skipped are called as the stride length. We take these k-mers and represent them as nodes in a global structural graph. Nodes are connected to each other by the order of co-occurrence of the k-mers. So in this case, ATT, ATA, TCG are k-mers, which will be connected right there. Now that we have connected the k-mers, some of these k-mers might occur multiple times. So we add weights to the direction of the flow of the k-mers. And now we take the average of these weights and add them as vectors in an n-dimensional space. In the end, all these vectors will right now be represented in a 128 dimension space, and k-mers that are closely related with each other will be close in an n-dimensional space, while k-mers that are unrelated with each other will appear far away. This is one pattern that we can use for identifying pathogen. The next step is taking each and every single DNA sequence and representing them as images, or we call them as pseudo-images. We take the k-mer patterns from the previous step, and based on the relative co-occurrence, we plot them as dots or pixels. Each pixel is representative of the frequency of co-occurrence between two k-mers. And the coloring of these pixels range from darkest gray to brightest white, where darkest gray means it's the lowest co-occurrence of k-mer, and brightest white means it is the highest co-occurrence of k-mer. At the end of this step, every single individual read or every single individual DNA sequence in a metagenome is now represented as an image. So if a DNA sample has around 100,000 DNA sequences, we get 100,000 images. Now coming to our final step is where we combine the global representation, that is the vector graph, and the local representation, that is the images, to identify patterns that are specific for the pathogen. A classic example is any facial recognition technology. Any facial recognition technology uses your face, that's the global representation, and your iris or nostril pattern, that's your local representation, to identify an individual accurately. The same way, we take the vector representation and the pseudo images, we add them to modified convolution neural networks, which, will, which has all these generic pattern recognition filters, which will identify patterns that are specific for the pathogen. We teach these filters about pathogen fil patterns, and that's why they can recognize them. For this algorithm development, we sequenced 13 bovine respiratory disease clinical samples. Bovine respiratory disease, again, is caused by six different bacteria and five different viruses. We sequenced them using MinION or GridION, and we used seven of those samples to train our machine learning algorithm, five to test the algorithm, and one to validate this algorithm. For standardization, we used different k sizes for the global representation, that's the vectors, and the local representation, that's the pseudo-image. And we also evaluated the number of sequences needed to train our algorithm in the third step. The first step was to assess the k size that is needed for better identification of host and non-host trees. And as we increase our k size, our precision and recall seem to improve. Uh, precision here is a binary diagnostic equivalent for positive predictive value, and recall is the binary diagnostic equivalent for sensitivity. F1 scores are combination metrics that combine precision and recall and give us a good value about the accuracy. And with a k-mer of phi and a stride length, that is the number of bases between two consecutive k-mers, we had highest possible precision and recall in identifying host and non-host reads. 
The next step was to identify the number of sequences that are needed to train our convolution neural network uh, for identifying pathogens. Now we had different number of sequences for the training for training the algorithm. We started with zero sequences and went all the way to thousand sequences and used everything in the end. Now I wanted to reiterate that most of the clinical sample is comprised from host DNA and there is only one to five percent from pathogens, common cells and environmental sources. So as we increase the number of DNA sequences that were used to train the algorithm, our precision and recall seemed to improve. And when we used all the sequences that were available to us, we had maximum possible precision and recall. Some of the pathogens right here, such as Pasharella multocida right there, and Bibostenia trehalosi have very low precision and recall. This could be due to the fact that we did not have any clinical sample that had high numbers of Pasharella and Bibostenia. So that is why in the future we are planning on sequencing more samples to better train this algorithm. To conclude, our algorithm shows promising results for multiplexed, metagenome-based pathogen detection using machine learning and neural networks. And with more clinical data, this algorithm can be modified to be faster and accurate in pathogen detection. And I would like to acknowledge National Animal Health Laboratory Network for funding this project, and our collaborators, Dr. Narasimhan and Dr. Bhagavadi in the Department of Computer Science, and my advisor, Dr. Ramachandran at Oklahoma Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory. Thank you. We have time for a question. I was wondering, did you measure the positive and negative predictive value? Uh, so currently, the machine learning algorithm does not use negative predictive value. It only uses positive predictive value and sensitivity. But thank you so much for the question, Dr. Lund. OK. All right. Thank you again for a great presentation. Okay, our last speaker is uh, Kashalia Jayalakilak from the Department of Physiological Sciences at OSU College of Veterinary Medicine, and she's going to talk to us about equine dysregulation and noble inflammatory target. Thank you, Dr. Lacum, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank, uh, thank uh, the organizing committee of the Interact Symposium for giving me this amazing opportunity. Today, I'm going to present my um, thesis project on novel inflammatory targets, underlying equine insulin dysregulation. Uh, I'm sure most of you all are familiar with the term equine metabolic syndrome, but if you are not familiar with that term, um, it is a similar condition to type 2 diabetes in humans, and it has been recently discovered in the clinical floor of the veterinary field. Equine metabolic syndrome, or EMS, causes insulin dysregulation in equids like horses, ponies, and donkeys. Um, when we are talking about insulin dysregulation, there are two main uh, terms that are being heavily discussed. The first term is hyperinsulinemia, where the insulin levels of the blood in those animals are higher than the normal levels. And the second term is insulin resistance, where uh, the insulin sensitive tissues fail to respond to insulin in the body. Similar to human diabetes, um, despite of veterinary care and management provided to these animals, uh, this uh, EMS is followed by many other various complications as well. Development of clinical laminitis is one of the major complications associated with EMS. Uh, laminitis, or the uh, inflammation of the lamellae of the hooves, uh, can cause ultimately rotation of the coffin bone, and uh, this is debilitating and also very severely painful to the animals. But the pathogenesis underlying this condition and also how this uh, causes all these complications is not very well explained. With that being said, there's no specific treatment found or identified in the clinical floor for this condition. 
So we may uh, try dietary restrictions and regular exercises to control obesity of these animals. And also if we encounter with uh, other clinical signs, we can go for symptomatic treatments. Uh, but at the same time, um, exercising a lame horse is not going to help. It's going to make it worse. So all these are not specific to the condition. All the bad things aside, good news is, not like in uh, human diabetes, increased prevalence of cardiac diseases has not been reported uh, following equine insulin dysregulation. Our hypothesis uh, for this project is insulin dysregulation causes inflammation, cy inflammatory cytokine-mediated alteration in acute phase protein in horses in a tissue-specific manner. We have used two equine dis uh, insulin dysregulation models in this project. The first one is a hyperinsulinemic clamp model, where the horses were given with a 48-hour intravenous infusion with either insulin in the hyperinsulinemic group or a balanced electrolyte solution in the control group. Um, compared to the control group, uh, the hyperinsulinemic horses developed and maintained hyperinsulinemia, and uh, both of the groups maintained euglycemia throughout. Another thing I would like to highlight here is that regardless of being clinically healthy in the first place, the hyperinsulinemic horses developed clinical laminitis. The second model is natural equine insulin resistant model or natural EMS model where the horses were categorized into either insulin resistant group or insulin sensitive group depending on uh, an IV intravenous glucose tolerance test results. These are some vessel parameters obtained from these horses. Um, what I want to emphasize here is that the insulin sensitivity was significantly lower in the insulin resistant group compared to the insulin sensitive horses. So we have uh, samples obtained from these horses and uh, using Western bloods, we um, uh, analyzed all the expression of all the proteins which are listed on the left, far left side of the slide. Um, and uh, to give you a, a brief guide to my next few slides, each and every uh, figure, uh, there's a figure of representative blood in the upper section of the figure, and all the proteins are expression is uh, normalized to uh, a loading control, uh, for an example, in this case, beta actin. The bottom section of each figure represents the data analysis. So let's first look at interleukin 1 beta expression on these tissues. In lamellae, following hyperinsulinemia, we could observe an upregulation of interleukin 1 beta uh, compared to their control counterpart. Uh, and in cardiac tissues, we did not observe any upregulation or change in interleukin 1 beta following hyperinsulinemia. Uh, in subcutaneous ad adipose tissue obtained from uh, the natural EMS horses did not show any uh, change of interleukin 1 beta expression. In contrast to that, we could observe a uh, an upregulation of interleukin 1 beta in visceral adipose tissue obtained from the natural EMS horses. Talking about HSP90 protein expression, uh, in lamellae, we could observe a uh, higher expression of HSP90 protein expression following hyperinsulinemia. Uh, similarly, we did not observe any change of HSP90 protein expression following hyperinsulinemia. Uh, in subcutaneous tissue obtained from natural EMS model, we did not see any change of uh, HSP90 as well. Um, on the other hand, in visceral adipose tissue, we could observe an upregulation of HSP90 as well. In skeletal muscles obtained from hyperinsulinemic horses, uh, we did not uh, see any change of HSP90 protein expression, but in contrast, in skeletal muscles obtained from the natural insulin resistant horses, we observed an upregulation of HSP90 protein. 
Moving on to alpha uh, two macroglobulin, similar to other proteins, we could observe an upregulation uh, of uh, in alpha two macroglobulin in lamellae following hyperinsulinemia. Uh, but again, we did not see any change of alpha-2 macroglobulin as well in the heart following insulin dysregulation. Subcutaneous tissue did not show any uh, change of alpha-2 macroglobulin as well. Similar to other proteins, we uh, saw an increase of alpha-2 macroglobulin of, in the visceral adipose tissue following natural EMS as well. We investigated all the three isoforms of fibrinogen, namely alpha, beta, and gamma uh, proteins uh, in uh, these tissues. And uh, similar to all the other proteins, we could see an upregulation of uh, fibrinogen isoforms in lamellae following hyperinsulinemia. Uh, interestingly, we did not see any uh, upregulation or any change of uh, fibrinogen isoforms in heart uh, following hyperinsulinemia. So, to summarize, um, we could show an upregulation of HSP90, alpha-2 macroglobulin, and fibrinogen isoforms, and also interleukin-1-beta in lamellae following insulin dysregulation. Uh, in visceral adipose tissue, uh, HSP90, alpha-2 macroglobulin, in, and interleukin-1-beta was upregulated. In contrast to that, subcutaneous tissue had only fibrinogen uh, upregulation, and this, these results are in line with previous studies where it has been discussed that visceral adipose tissue have higher inflammation going on compared to subcutaneous adipose. No significant difference of protein expression in skeletal muscles was observed except HSP90. Interestingly, any of the proteins which, were, uh, which we investigated was not upregulated or changed following insulin dysregulation in heart. Today, for the uh, time restrictions, I'm, ta uh, I'm talking about only few proteins in those tissues, but we could observe a similar tissue-specific upregulation of interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha protein expression. To conclude, um, using two unique equine models, uh, we could show um, a tissue-specific upregulation of inflammatory proteins during uh, equine insulin dysregulation. And these results may no, uh, reveal novel biomarkers and also potential therapeutic targets for equine metabolic syndrome. The interesting fact is that the lack of uh, increase of inflammatory proteins in the heart could underscore potential cardioprotective mechanisms. With that, I would like to thank my committee members and lab members in the Comparative Metabolism Laboratory and also, again, at the Interact Organizing Committee for giving me this opportunity. With that, I would like to take any questions. Thank you, Kesharia. Sure. So Kasharia, could you repeat the question? Yeah. Since it's not a um, if I understood the, your question correctly, are you asking if I checked these uh, protein levels in the serum as well in those animals? Uh, yeah, that is actually a, an excellent question because in this project we did not uh, check those uh, serum levels, but uh, it is better if we had the chance to check those. But um, in previous studies, it is shown that um, cytokines like uh, interleukins and TNF-alpha are increased in a serum in horses following insulin dysregulation. But for now, for my project, we are just checking the levels of these proteins in uh, the tissues. So uh, I hope you understand. Uh, I hope I uh, addressed your question. Thank you for the question, though. Any other question? All right. If not, thank you again, Kasharia. Thank you. This
That's going to conclude our last session of uh, the research symposium day. Again, I think we had many great presentations. And I propose, actually, a, a round of applause for all the presenters today. I think they all did a great job. So congrats to all of you. And congrats again for an outstanding research symposium day. I'm going to let uh, now Dr. Pig giving you a couple housekeeping announcement. Just as a reminder, we will close out the day in the lobby with our awards ceremony. I encourage you to make sure that you have drink tickets in your name badges. If you do not, please visit the registration table and we'll get you taken care of for that. Um, it will take a moment or two to get set up in the lobby so that we have appropriate audio there as well as the podium, so please uh, be patient with us. Uh, use those drink tickets and uh, we will get started shortly. For those of you that are attending via the live stream virtually, we cannot thank you enough for joining us today, uh, in particular our international attendees that have been able to, to join in to the Interact Symposium. Finally, we want to recognize the Interact committee members, Giovanna Paloma, particularly for all her hard work coordinating all of the speaker presentations as well as the poster presentations, putting those together. Doctors Brandau, Jones, Holbrook, Lacombe, Malaire, Panafi, Butcher, and Rudd from the College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Conway from the College of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Ramsey from the College of Engineering, Architecture and Technology, as well as Dr. Vasquez from the School of Biomedical Sciences at OSU Center for Health Sciences. I'd also like to thank Dr. Ron John for giving me the opportunity to moderate as well as my fellow moderators today. So we will see you in the lobby. Thanks so much for joining us. I do know that Dr. Ron John is planning uh, for our next symposium already, and so um, be putting that on your calendar once our dates are announced. He has big plans and we encourage you to take part and continue the collaborations that I know have started today. Thank you so much.